everyone. Welcome to Mind Pump. In the first half of this episode, we talk about how to eat to get jacked for less than $10 a day, ways to quit caffeine without losing your mind, as well as other topics. In the second half of the show, the guys coach four live callers on questions such as, I'm training for a triathlon. What's the best way for me to work out? to maximize my performance. I'm trying to hit some new PRs. How should I structure my training to hit my goals? What is the best way to train to have endurance and strength for outdoor activities? And what do you think of Louis Simmons and West Side Barbell Training? One more thing before we get started, we have a lot of free resources, including a lot of free guides on how to build your butt, how to build muscle, how to lose fat, how to become a better personal trainer. You can find all of this over at mindpumpfree.com. All right, enjoy the show. There's a huge myth that bulking is expensive. Totally false. In fact, you could get jacked for under ten dollars. I want to hear all about this, Adam. You said say this. <laughs> you know, I I was thinking about I've been sick this last week, and so you know, eating a lot of soup. Katrina had just uh, got back from Costco, and she was like preparing Max's stuff from the the rotisserie chicken took me back to like, you know, when I was a bachelor, lived by myself and I used to live off of hamburger helper. And, mm. you know, it's like you, if you buy ground beef in bulk, mm -hmm. you go to Costco and you get rotisserie chicken, which, think, which they lose money on. That's but, yeah, it's like $4 yeah. for two, a two pound chicken. Okay. Uh, and top ramen noodles, or <laughs> hamburger helper. And Did by the way, tough, Robin? I just, yeah, I just want to make this clear because I know you're gonna, we're going to have some people who are always like, that's not healthy. It's like, listen, if, if your rebuttal to must be a junior high. eating and hitting your protein intake in order to build muscle or bulk, which is the, like one of the, the number one things I hear from people that say they can't do it is because it's so expensive to that. You can do that for really cheap. You can. And I'm going to yeah. give you an assist because you said top ramen. So I'm going to give you an assist here. <laughs> like, like just a bag of rice, dry rice, which has a long shelf life, like top ramen, uh, but it's also complex carbs. And I could, we could argue obviously healthier or whatever. You could have dry, just white rice, beans, bulk ground beef. You could buy chicken, like you said, and frozen vegetables. And you have very inexpensive, healthy, bulking food right there. Proteins, fats, carbohydrates, everything you need. In a very expensive, uh, inexpensive meal, and, and for the and for the people that are going to you know shit on the health side of it, listen. If you are le uh, leaner, more muscular, and 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 you balance your your calories out, you're in a, a better health position than somebody who overconsumes you know oh. uh, foods that you would fall in that. that you, you just said yep. a controversial true thing. A, a, a huge percentage of the negative health effects that come from food, not all. Okay, but a huge percentage simply come from the overconsumption yes. of food. Always live in that surplus. That's right. So if you, if you, especially if you're not building muscle or it's just you're always there and you're inactive on top of it, if you look at the studies that can that connect things like sugar, mm -hmm. fat, or saturated fat, or sodium to poor health, what they fail to control for are the fact that those three things, sugar, salt, and fat, are the key ingredients in making food hyper palatable. So what does that mean? that those people also probably overate. Yep. And there's many studies that show, and I'm not saying this is ideal because you're probably not going to feel great eating this way, but there's many studies that show a high sugar diet, that's low calorie, people's health improves. A high saturated fat diet, low calorie, people's health improves. So the calories make the biggest, not all the difference, but the biggest difference. So to kind of back you up a little bit, Adam, like um, you, you, can, you can eat certain foods and if it's within your caloric intake, and so long as it doesn't make you feel bad and all that stuff, it doesn't cause obvious issues. You're going to be okay as long as you know you don't do it all the time, right? Yeah, I lived off that stuff oh, yeah. for my early twenties for sure. Yeah, I did the uh, the Costco chickens like that that kept me alive in college. That between that and um, I would get all those burger patties that you could just get from Costco that were just like rows and stacks of them, and yeah. I would throw it on um, the uh, George Foreman. Oh, and George Foreman. The George Foreman was was game changer to get me away from the cafeteria. The cafeteria only provided like carbs and, and like starchy carbs yeah. and all that. It just never I, uh, gave me sustenance. I loved the George Foreman. The thing I hated about it was cleaning it. And then I found something that they don't make anymore called the Rocket Grill. Did you guys ever hear about this? Uh -uh. It used these parchment paper pouches. You'd put your patty in that. Say that three times fast. Then you'd grill it. And then you have to clean nothing. I was like, this was invented by a dude for sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it's a dude. I don't yeah. like to clean. You know, yeah, cleaning sucks. It's a, 
No, but but you know, eating healthy. There's a huge myth that even eating healthy in any way, shape, or form is somehow more expensive. And the problem, and I blame our industry for for promoting this myth because what what our industry does really well is make exotic things look like they're more important than the foundational things. Like this is healthier because it's mm -hmm. you know cows that were raised like this that were fed this particular thing or these plants which are specific to this region or whatever. So you end up eating quote unquote healthy food, but it's exotic yeah. and it's stuff with small markets. And so you're spending a lot more money. It's like shopping well, at Whole Foods yeah. and getting all your stuff. If there. you so have the expensive. resources, you know, to kind of go in that direction. I mean, that's just a smart thing to consider is like up your quality of uh, food that, and nutrients that you're intaking. But, you know, in terms of like getting it done and, and being able to like make progress and then also stay relatively healthy, like you can do that on a budget. No problem. Totally, yeah, totally. we actually still, I mean, we're, I, we, you, I don't do the hamburger helper and I did actually have top problem. I've never had sick. hamburger helper, by the way. Is that, oh my a, God. is that a season? Like it's a staple it's, it's for a, my all mom. it is is a yeah. box of noodles with yeah. a package of seasoning. seasoning. And then you had your hamburger. Yeah. yeah. Oh. And I actually used to do a lot with ground turkey. So like I would, and that's how I'd like go. So I'd be actually pretty good. Bulking, dude. I would put, it is for actually, process, it is pretty you know. de decent. <laughs> it's it 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 kind of bomb. And for a bachelor, it's hella easy. It is so easy to like follow and make and it makes this. Is when you invite a girl over for dinner? No, I just. <laughs> I was not trying to. Really, I, listen, I've been it's grilling really since wilder. I was a kid, right? So I could at least grill. So if I was trying to impress you a girl, are good, you are good. On so the if I was trying to impress a girl yeah. when I was in, I would, I would, you know what though? Did you see that meme I posted the other day? The, the typical guy though who smokes a smokes a chicken. Doug would appreciate this. Smokes a chicken for eight hours and then that's it. Like that's, oh, that's I, dinner. I, I, yeah. I right. It was like it was like a, it was a girl who was tweeting something like complaining about dudes that do that. And I'm like, oh, I'm so guilty of that. I'm just like, yeah. There's no side. She's there's like, no oh, you're gonna you're gonna grill yeah. today. You're, so she's like, oh, you're cooking dinner, right? And like, all right, here it is. I've been smoking it for six hours like that. And she's like, yeah. any sides, did vegetables? You're a knife cool. out. Ah. No, I did, the, I did hey, that. How many times have we had a meal like that? No. We all go up to truck oh, and it's just, it. I love those kind of meals. It doesn't, it doesn't even be fancy. That's why, that's why that tweet hit good. I was like, oh yeah, it's, I know there's got to be a lot of guys that can yeah. relate to that. You know what's funny sure. is when I would, when I used to, as a kid, when I used to bulk because when I learned how to do it properly and I was trying to hit targets, protein, all that stuff, because I was trying to hit targets, uh, it was really hard. This is before you could find calories and stuff real easy on places you would eat out. I just, I would make my own food and I would end up, you know, and I wasn't super into like following my budget. I mean, I, I managed gyms and, you know, I lived at home. So I didn't, but I did notice I would spend less money. I'm like, this is weird. Why am I spending? It's because I was buying ground beef, rice, beans, frozen yeah. vegetables, that kind of stuff. Yeah. It was cheaper than going out to eat. And I was eating more calories and getting more protein. So it makes yeah. it. Do you guys use a lot of the, like I was saying that I don't use hamburger helper and top ramen so much, but I do the rotisserie chicken is a staple in our house. Oh, like that, yeah. That's oh, how yeah. we do a lot of uh, Max's stuff. She just tears it off and then that's his serving is off of the. the it's a big time saver, especially if you get it like already pre-cooked. Yeah. Is that similar to uh, wait, uh hamburger helper? What is what you get? What would you get? No, not I'm sorry. You said hamburger helper. Yeah. The what's it called? Uh, Manwich or whatever. Is that similar? <laughs> what's do you guys remember that? Yeah, what's I remember that? that was just in a can, and then you'd like oh, put it it's in different. A, um, oh, I've never even seen that before. So when I've I was, heard of it, I don't know what it's it like is. It's like a sloppy Joe. You That's know? it. Yeah. Okay, so oh. when, I, when I was a kid, I uh, only Extra because I, was, I just wanted to be strong, and I remember the commercial like it's a man witch. Like, oh, that's what men eat. Yeah. And my mom refused to buy it, so I had no <laughs> idea what it was. <laughs> I actually didn't even know what that was. Oh, that was not. They used to target like single men, you know, like all the time, especially with those like like pre made like frozen. Oh, the sloppy meals. Joe. It looks like a can of dog food. Yeah, well, see, it, and that, that, yeah. I mean, obviously, I know why my mom said no. But as a kid, the advertising worked on me. I was like, man. Uh, sloppy Joe's are good, though. It, it is good. a Sloppy Joe, isn't it? And I forget what's it. Sloppy Joe is basically just, uh, just hamburger meat, meat, barbecue sauce, yeah. and then uh, and then the, the, the bun, right? Yeah. Is that it? It just I think gets so. all over you. That's, you know. I We used to have one when I was a kid. At least for me. Uh, when we <laughs> everything, were, everything gets all over me. Well, <laughs> yeah. people, you know what you're talking about, bro. <laughs> a regular state. You can't even have a You, can't even you guys just see all my clothes, dude. It's just like just stains and like chunks of like... What, what was that one time so Adam just spilled? I mean, Adam uh, just spilled all his whole Starbucks. It was, we were at Starbucks. <laughs> he was so and, bad. and what was funny about it was we were. It was when we were going down to see Bishop Barron. I'll never oh, forget it because yeah. I we forgot were, all about that. We were already razzing Justin about how he eats and stuff like that. I think we had just came out. We just 
came from somewhere not long. He before. just he's intense with, with and then we <laughs> and then we sit down to have a like a you know a, a coffee or something and and sure shit it's like all over the place and I'm like bro you can't even drink a fucking coffee without <laughs> feeling <laughs> seriously dude just, I got nervous yeah. <laughs> I don't know put too much pressure on. Yeah. dude you guys want to hear something super cringy so I, I embarrass <laughs> it, I embarrass the shit out of myself so you know we've been talking in past episodes like how different you are and how much wiser you get as you get older and how 10 years makes a big difference, right? So Facebook has this feature that where they show you like, oh, you posted this 10 years ago, right? Yeah. Now, sometimes a picture of my kids, I'm like, oh my God, look when they were so little. Oh, and I get teary. Every once in a while, it's a stupid post they did 10 years ago. Oh God. I'm like, why did, why did I post that? I'm on Facebook. My family's fine. All I posted this is the I'm gonna to show you guys. Like an ass pick of yourself? No. It's just <laughs> it's just my arm flexing. Okay. <laughs> it's just his arm. Dude. And then and then and then underneath the caption, such it, a says, sal post. it says boom. That's how I post it. <laughs> it says boom. What am I doing, bro? That's so embarrassing. Ten years. I'm in my thirties. Like, recognize. Like, oh, yeah, I hate like, it. All your family. So I yeah. mean, I mean, don't you try now? I mean, the filter I try to look through is like, uh, what am I going to like? Whenever before I post, totally. before I do something, like, is this something is this ten years from now? Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm going to look back and be like, uh, yeah. What, was it you, bro? The Twitter feature where it's like they give you a certain amount of time now. Like, Thirty seconds. Oh, yeah. Yeah, should I post it? Should I not post it? That's, I think that's brilliant. It's a it is a brilliant. I think that's a. a, a is it? 30, it's longer than thirty seconds. No, it's thirty second. Is wanna, it? I want to say yeah. I oh, I thought so. it was. You have this like little circle that you can see. The then timer. you still edit it. Yeah, because that dude, there are yeah. some cringy. Are you sure ones. you want to say that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they should have that on text as yeah. well with a breathalyzer. Did you take a Xanax sensor. before you did this? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that should be a question. Or you just a breathalyzer, and then it says, "All right, now all your text will have a one minute pause." Yeah. And know whether or not you should send that text anyway. Oh uh, yeah. All right, today's free program giveaway is MAPS Power Lift. Here's how you can win access to that. You want to leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Make sure you subscribe to this channel and then turn on notifications. And then what we'll do is we'll go through the comments, we'll pick the winner, and we'll notify you in the comment section that you got free access to MAPS Power Lift. Also, we got a sale going on this month. We created three workout bundles. Each one of them gives you up to nine months of planned Workout, so nine months of exercise program. Each one is at least $300 off, huge discount, all right? Go check these three bundles out. All you gotta do is click on the link at the top of the description below to find out more or just to sign up. All right, here comes the show. I got to introduce you guys though, too. I saw like today, one of our sponsors is the Mobility Wall. Mm. And this is one of them that I actually was approached a long time ago uh, to try out. And he was able to send us like some of the product. And so I had it like installed in my house. I, I think I posted one video on it, but dude, I love this thing. I think it's, it's so great, especially if you're a coach and like you were like me and you would go into somebody's house that like, um, basically like what, what it eliminates is it solves a problem of, of having to put somebody on the ground where you get a lot of pressure on the joints and like your shoulder and elbow. And so you're able to lean into this foam roll that's, you know, knotted and everything uh, and it has attachments and you can actually like, you know, really target areas like in the hips and in the shoulders um, uh, a lot more effectively by putting it in between the door frame. So a lot of people don't, uh, maybe, maybe people don't know this, but this is a, a challenge for trainers is when you, foam rolling can be utilized very effectively in conjunction with mobility work. And it's really, really, it, it can be really effective at, at turbocharging or helping you achieve better mobility. Unlocking movement potential. Yeah. Now yeah. the challenge with foam rolling is yeah. Exactly what Justin, what you said, which is getting on the floor, getting in the right positions. And for a lot of people, it's too much pressure at first. They can't get into you, position. You still have to lift yourself up, yep. like off the ground. Some, a lot of my clients didn't have the strength to do that, really, if it's an elderly client or it's somebody's really deconditioned. Uh, so this is a great alternative to that. And it's super easy. Like when I install it, literally all you got to do is like kind of twist it so it like pushes into the wall a little more um, tightly. Oh, it even has an attachment for the For the like ball. a little ball. Oh, yeah. that's cool. A little ball attachment. Do we have an extra one here? Because I'm going to bring one to my dad. We do. Okay. We do. We have an extra one. Um, oh, we have an app that goes with it too? Yeah, so there's the exercises all go with it. And also too, like, so they now have an attachment where it can, for a squat rack, 
Like you can literally put it like in between the squat racks. So if you don't have to like move and so you could do all your whole workout and then also have it right there. Oh, so you can boom and then yeah. squat. Oh, that's clever. So oh, that, that's actually very smart. Yeah, I thought that was pretty How cool. it, So okay, you, were, I, I knew when this got sent to us, so I'm like, of all the people, Justin will be the one to probably take this. And is it implement. sturdy enough? Yeah, like that's you, what I was going to ask. Like, is, can you yes. really lean into it and so like that? Because that would be my concern. It's real surprising. And uh, I saw actually too the, um, you know how they have those um, pull-up, uh, apparatuses yeah. that go in between the yeah, door. Yeah, yeah. So now they're adopting this um, technology that that pushes into the door more because it's even more secure, I swear. Because the other one, a lot of times you'd, sometimes it would get on the molding and it would start pulling yeah. and ripping it off. It, has, it doesn't affect it like that at all. It just literally smashes into the side. Well, I just oh, also smart. saw that it's got two lips on the other side. So if you're afraid of yeah. pushing against it, you go on that side. Yeah. And then you're not going to push it's it It's super sturdy. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so, cool. Well, that's very good. It's a new partner. Yeah, so just Ju check them out. Justin, I got. I, I, I read this article today. I thought Justin's going to love this uh, article. <laughs> okay. So it it the, the so scientists have been kind of they, they debate like what's going on? Why does it why haven't we been contacted by aliens? Why haven't we been able to find <laughs> aliens? Like, you know, is is life that rare? Like what's the deal? And so there's several theories okay. as to why we have yet to con be contacted or meet Aliens because they live among us. Well, so here's <laughs> come on, man. <laughs> well, Justin, we're not trying to tell the truth. <laughs> I want to tell everybody the other theories. All right, what are the theories? So here's the first theory, and then I'm going to go through these, and then you guys let me know which one you think sounds the best. So the first one is the zoo theory. The zoo theory. Aliens uh -huh. see us as an attraction in their little zoo, essentially, yeah. and we could be part of a type of a nature preserve yeah. that has been set off limits, so free to grow, unperturbed by intelligent life, kind of like we do with yeah. like they come visit, pet us, you know, like like sing. Yeah. natural, you know, like, oh, we got to save the elephants or whatever. So oh nobody can build it. Yeah. So oh there's that. God. Okay. The next one is called the great filter theory, which is that other intelligent life died in mass extinctions. Ooh. And we're most definitely the next ones. Ooh, cool. Uh, next one is the self-imposed quarantine theory. This is the opposite of the zoo theory. Aliens have the potential of being dangerous. So they may have collectively decided to stay the hell at home and not draw attention to themselves. So mm. it's for their own safety. Mm hmm Another one is the rare earth theory. We are extremely special and unique, and we are simply the only intelligent life that there is in the universe. And then the last one is- Narcissist the, uh, 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 earth people. Yeah. And the last one is the great silence theory. Aliens have a really big and obnoxious ego that makes them believe they are too intelligent and we aren't worth their time. <laughs> yeah. So which, which one is the- Yeah, I like the last one. We're just like ants. Yeah. yeah. So like, why would we say Compared anything to, to those them. guys? I, you know, I kind of believe in the rare earth theory. I think the universe is so big and expansive and the conditions required for life are relatively rare enough that we just haven't run into anybody or yeah. nobody's run into us. That's my I'd name. like to think there's like an intergalactic federation already <laughs> that we didn't know about that has, has these rules that you can only visit us, you know, every now and then and you can't be visible. Uh, otherwise, that's, you know, an infraction and then you're going to get in trouble for that on your home planet. You know, so so there's like rules and regulations on how they they travel. You know, in and out. We're, we're a protected, uh, yeah, endangered. It's more species. like Star Trek. Yeah, They're like this, these 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 animals only live on one planet. They're an endangered. We have species. to let them grow and get to the point where they're going to self implode, and then we intervene. Because oh. that's why they're always watching us when we get you know, further along with like the atom bomb and nuclear energy. Have you energy. heard that, by the way? Every no. Anytime we do like a technological breakthrough that could potentially destroy us, there's more UFO sightings. Yeah, UFO stuff. sightings, Mothman. I mean, let's get, let's whoa, get crazy. Whoa. Didn't we? Slow down, bro. <laughs> one thing one at a time. One conspiracy at a time for me, bro. I can't take them all in at once. <laughs> I'm just Did, saying. Didn't some just, is, is this uh, this new reading or the reading you're doing right now, is it promoted for, didn't something just come out in the news? Like somebody, was it in Russia or someone that shot down a UFO or something that shot oh. at or what? Oh, I did see that yeah. yeah i figured one of you guys i don't seen. know what? yeah that just uh -huh. came out it just came so, out came last out. week ufo stuff is like way like feels like it's more it's and more stuff coming out and then more ufo stuff from the government's coming out we're like oh yeah we know we'll these. think about how rapidly we're changing now like with technology and like on the brink of ai and like um you know i i again to to the point of like once we uh once we reach a level of intelligence in terms of like the technology, like for self-destruction, I feel like maybe if that theory goes like, then I, they're going to be more visible. I, I am, uh, 
I'm still, and I know probably, and I apologize for the audience that doesn't care about this stuff because I, this is the unfortunate truth about this show because it is just ourselves and what we talk. I'm so fascinated by the chat GPT thing uh, right now that that's all I talk about because it's, <laughs> it's hard not see, to think about it. It is hard not to think about it. Did you guys see the post that Alex Ramosi just did yeah, to I compare? Did. Yeah. yeah, you should. Did me you that. see it, crazy. Doug? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I saw so it. So he did this, he did a, a comparison I mean, of that's very, I think that's very, very of accurate. Chat GPT one. And, and, and I, well, it's not, it, it, it's, it's, it's a fact. It's like how much the, the, he, he showed a mathematical comparison yeah. of, how much more is being put into chat GPT two in comparison to one for, so for all the critics out there that are just like, Oh, GPT one is just, Oh, it's not this. It's not going to replace people. And it's not gonna be able to this and that. And, and it's like, yeah, but when you look at where they're at at version one and where version two is already supposed to look like, like, I mean, version 10 is going to be like unbelievable. The capabilities of this, oh. and this is knocking on our door. It is here. It's like Dude, look at look at the first look at the very first websites and then what they look like five years later or yep. ten years later, right? That's a massive difference. This is uh improving at a far faster, more accelerated rate. So I think that we're gonna reach we're close. I don't know how close yeah. we are, but we're getting to the point where the 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 chat GPT is gonna start solving its own problems. And then forget well, about didn't it. didn't they say this latest version, like you could give it just like a, a single word prompt and they could write like a 60 page novel. Yeah. Like something crazy. So like that's this. okay. So in the so all in pod schools are trying to ban it right now. Yeah. Good so in the, in, the all in, gonna ban in the all in podcast, uh, they all went around and we're talking about what they're, they're most excited about in uh, trends and media, media stuff for this year. They all went around and talked about, new shows like uh, doom part two is coming out and like until it got to Friedberg, the science guys with that. And he's like, I'm most excited for what we're going to see from AI this year. He goes, this year we will, we will see a novel written by AI. No. We, will, we will see a movie created by AI. Wow. And he goes, so I'm unbelievably interested in to see what that looks like and how much we like it or not. So like, I well, made it. Okay. Go I'm going to make a prediction right now yeah. <laughs> because, because uh, figuring out how to get people to, because we look, humans know this, okay? Marketers know this. There's a formula: how to get eyes, how to get views, how to get interest, how to trigger excitement, and all that stuff, right? So, AI will be able to do it better at some point, and we'll be able to create content and entertainment that will blow away yeah. anything that humans can create. So, I think in the future, it's going to be marketable for people to start marketing uh, entertainment and, and content as organic. Yeah, <laughs> like this, like this, like Mind Pump My podcast, brought you human by, made by four organic men. <laughs> yes, like, you know, it, it made by biologically, people. you know, mass. Uh, biological so okay, that's going to be a marketing thing. The reason why I wanted to bring this up is actually, and I think we kind of talked about it uh, a little bit on the on the show before. Of like, what are what are the challenges that you guys see that they run it? And this, they got into a really good discussion, and they didn't get to finish it. They're like, we should do a whole episode around this and bring somebody on. But I think we were already leaning towards this, where this is going to get interesting is the the copyright and patent and like so you got to understand that this AI is using real people's stuff and content to create its own original content right like that's it it, it instantly scours the entire internet and it pulls like the artist it pulls from authors it pulls from all of that to then aggregate all this data to put out the best version or perfect whatever right so how are you going to protect these people that create that, these creators that create this content or how are they going to be entitled? So let's say it makes a amazing movie and it's like totally reflects like say AI utilizes, and these are just total arbitrary numbers, like 60% of Quentin Tarantino's type of writing to make this style. And then, and then of course the other 40 is. So current copyright laws are designed for humans, meaning I can read books and I can watch movies. Yeah. We don't have and any. Use that as inspiration to create my own. AI on the other hand is going to be totally different. So current copyright laws won't touch AI because AI is going to create content that will skirt around. That's what's copyright. So what's interesting about this conversation is that we don't have anything in place yet. I feel like what they're going to try to do is pass legislation. It's that going says, too fast for that. Yeah, they're going to say something like, if AI is going to go and read my content, it has to pay this much or it has to pay this fee or something like that. They're going to try and create barriers. So, okay, so that was that's a very logical thought, but also unrealistic 
because it scours millions of things to aggregate that. Yeah, I know. Mm -hmm. So it could be so it could literally where it got the so the so it, it literally could be this like and I used it, uh, an arbitrary number like forty or sixty percent of Quentin Tarantino, but the re more realistic thing is that it took four million different authors or yeah. you know and and took a fraction of all the best of all of theirs to aggregate this. And so what do you get? How are you going to divide up what you're entitled to? Well, so I'm going to take it a step further. Yeah. Let's say they do effectively create legislation, which I don't see how. I have no idea what that would look like. Uh, I don't even have a, a, a grasp of the, what that would look like. But let's say they did. What's to say that you can't have access to chat GBT 15 or whatever, and it just creates movies for you. Mm -hmm. It doesn't need to create movies for masses. For sale. It, no. It, so so it, it would, copyright lies don't matter wow. because it's not selling it to anybody. Yeah. It's just me going to my my AI entertain and say, me correct and well, it'll and it can do it instantly well that's where I, I agree with okay, and that's a very good point like that's where it will not get stopped and it will disrupt no matter what you have is your own that, personal entertainment for personal entertainment what it probably and that's a I bet you that's a good speculation it probably we will probably write some sort of legislation that keeps it from people profiting off of cre original creators right, work right. but for the average consumer which will to, crush the industry well, anyway. right, yeah, which, exactly which initially you're gonna have to prompt like i like this actor i like this type of movie i like and you kind of go through a laundry list of things and then it will just know like uh, you know based off of what it gathers up like okay he likes this so i'm gonna put this together now i so initially i think that's what'll happen well you're gonna enter in your favorite movies it'll scour your search so it learns you it'll scour your it'll learn you i think the next level because we can do this currently with technology, except it's super expensive and time intensive, whatever. But we can measure things like pupil dilation, skin temperature changes, yeah. your pulse. It's going to be so accurate, um, Your bro. gaze, you know, uh, hormonal change, whatever. Yeah. And it, it's not a crazy thing to say that we could potentially have AI that will create content perfectly based on your physiological responses. It won't even need to know what you like because yeah. it'll know what you like. Yeah. And it's going to make something. Right. And then the next thing it's going to make, it's going to hit that button. And you're going to be like, this is the best movie I've ever seen. I mean, this was the life. argument it's I was getting in with so Doug weird, uh, you just like yesterday or the day before. And he's just like, and I was like, listen, man, I, I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm already thinking like the potential of it replacing us, whether that's realistic in the next year or 10 years or not. My mind is there now because you, to your point right there, how fast it can start to, we have the, we already have that technology. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We already have the technology for, to measure all those things. So if we have those data points and we enter those, it already has an incredible starting point. And then like you said, it can start to morph to how you're reacting to the current. Did you guys ever see that show? I think I showed you that show of like a uh, new technology and stuff where it had like, will I am getting scanned oh, into the computer? I never watched it. Yeah. So he okay, so created an avatar. look exactly like him. Facial man, like a uh, mannerisms like the way that he answered questions the way he vocally like said and, and added uh, uh inflection and all that kind of stuff and so they they tried to gather as much data as possible on him and to where the point like he has a um a social media account just based off of his ai version of himself so you know my speculation <laughs> would be like maybe there's going to be places where you could literally scan yourself and then create like this like avatar version of you and then eventually keep feeding it data and then the ai uh could <laughs> potentially you put that person to work i, I have i haven't decided if we are at the greatest advantage or disadvantage personally us mm. because we've put so much content out into the ether that it just scours that that it just that we already they, it has so much information on you uh, the three of us <laughs> oh yeah because we've shared so it much it creates three hosts that, yeah. that, that are similar so yeah. that's what that was what i was trying to say to doug it's yeah. just like we are more vulnerable than a brand new three guys that are trying to start a business and they're creating yeah. as they go right. we've been inputting d data for the last eight years about us personally and structurally with the business that it could learn us and learn our business better and faster than it could somebody who's just, starting a business. We're, we're just going to have to have people that want organic content. You know what I mean? It's organic. Just well, like, I mean, I think, I think what you said off air was mm -hmm. actually really important and smart. And it's interesting because it, it aligns with like how we built this business, our goals for 2023. And that was building this loyalty with an audience yeah. before we even ever tried to make money or monetize. Yeah. And so getting back to those roots of 
continuing to pour more value, pour more of ourselves into our community. And so that there is this loyalty of, yeah, I know I can go get it cheaper. Yeah, I know I can go get it like this, but I have a loyalty to the, this human <laughs> who's provided so, this for me. So that was always true. I just didn't know what happened so quickly because if you look at the power of just the internet, right? So now you have access to all the information in the world. And what, that's, what that does, and if you look at markets, this tends to be the direction. It starts out very decentralized. Then it becomes centralized as you get these big corporations that purchase smaller ones. And then it becomes very decentralized again. And I think this is the most decentralizing, uh, disruptive type technology we've ever seen because you're going to create your own content, your own entertainment for you personally, and it's not going to be for everybody. So it's going to be interesting to figure out how companies and corporations are going to capitalize on that when it's going to be so decentralized, where it's going to be so personalized, like, you know, it's something so perfectly personalized for you, like other people might not like it nearly as much, but that's okay. You don't care right. because your AI created it just for you. So I don't know. It's going to be very interesting to see what that looks like. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> you'll eat bugs and you'll like it, right? I was going to say that. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I, I try and keep a more optimistic attitude about it. And I mean, obviously we're, we're talking about ways that we adopt it and we utilize it as a tool within the business and stuff. And I think that's obviously the first step in this. I'm not like trying to scare anybody, but if you, I don't know if you, if you, if you're sleeping on this and think it's not a I big know. deal, I think you're, I think you're crazy because I can't, I can't remember, um, the last thing that I was like, whoa, this could, yeah. this could really absolutely disruptive. Yeah. I mean like the internet, like the internet for us and in, in, at least in our lifetime and generation was probably the, the closest thing to this. And I actually you had think the industrial this revolution, which was very disruptive. Uh, you had the technological revolution, which we're still in, mm -hmm. which there's been points that have been very disruptive. The internet, I'll, I'll give you an, uh, this is a silly personal example. When I first left the managing gyms, one of the businesses I considered opening, because I left with the intention of starting my own business. One of the ones I considered was a supplement store. Everybody knows my complicated uh, relationship with supplements. <laughs> and I'm like, I want to open up a supplement store. But this was right around the time, I don't remember what year it was, 2000, 2001, where online supplement sales were starting to crush. Mm. And I saw how disruptive it was. I said, you know what? It's going to be, no one's going to want to, it's going to be so unprofitable to have a supplement store. Nobody's gonna buy supplements from the store when you can buy them online. Yeah. And so I ended up not doing it. So that's one silly example because before that, where'd you buy your supplements? Right. You had your local supplement store or whatever. So very disruptive. So there's gonna be a lot of jobs that are just not gonna exist, yeah. but then maybe potentially a lot of new ones that we can't even imagine. But I don't know. With something um, that can do so much, I don't even know. It's know funny because I, I, you know, I was thrown back because like I didn't have power and I was like trapped in my house and all that stuff. And then, um, you know, got my generator working again and, and we didn't have any kind of internet or streaming available. So I was like, what the hell, what am I going to do? And then you realize like, oh yeah, I have like DVDs. You know, I have, you like, have, DVDs? I have like three of them left. I remember getting rid of all of them. Like I'm not going to use these stupid things again, you know, like throw them like Frisbees. And uh, there was like, literally just, I have Star Wars, like the whole, you know, the trilogy. And then I have like the Matrix. And that was like, I have to keep those, you know, just <laughs> because, yeah. uh, you know, for so nostalgia. So I watched that. That was it, though. I was like, man, like they're so irrelevant. Now. Well, I so I believe it. I'm going through the same thing, only it's not because my power is out. It's because we moved and the we couldn't get an appointment sooner than two weeks from now to get our Internet. So I'm I'm barely in the beginning of these these two weeks. And it's been really interesting you know i've already gotten over the like the entertainment thing that you just dealt with like i've already accepted like well it's just you know i'm gonna read or i'm gonna talk to katrina and we'll just do other things that are probably really you know, important you know this sucks we gotta talk, i gotta talk to you <laughs> yeah, yeah, so i guess i'll do more of that right Tell not a bad something. thing so i've already accepted that <laughs> where i'm actually tripping out in is just man how much we've become dependent on that and just daily communication yes. work and things like yes. that like it's already been uh, quite the hurdle. Like I can't even I can't even text very well because the the, the iPhone runs off of the Wi Fi a lot of time to do the iPhone messages back and forth, and so that's delayed. Somebody can't send me uh, any sort of a file, you know. So if I like download yeah. something, oh, yeah. or you, didn't any, you didn't get any of Justin's naked pictures. No, none of the naked uh, pictures came through. Like too, too big of a file. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> 
stupid. It doesn't, it doesn't make cake. it. Doesn't but I mean, I mean, and I, I had a, I had a call that I had. I got another one today, and so I'm like, I gotta hang around here just so I could do it. I'm just like, man, it's, uh, it's funny how quickly we, ad- we adopt new technology, right? It's like you're resistant for a while, then you see it, then mm. you start to use it, and then you become dependent on it. And so that's where I see something like this is like, you can try and ignore it all you want right now, and maybe you're a late adopter with that, but eventually everybody will adopt it, and then it'll be interesting and kind of scary when you think about becoming dependent well, on AI. Well, look, yeah. you take modern per- a modern person, you throw them in the woods, they're dead. They're dead in a week, okay? That's what it's going to be like when you don't have your AI machine yeah. and it turns off. You'll be like, uh... I don't know what to yeah, do. Yeah, didn't you say yeah. that uh, Jordan Peterson predicted that like all universities- He said, he said a, a good chunk of universities are going to go bankrupt. Yeah. And how, how, clo- how soon of a time did he predict? She said he five said, years. Five years? Didn't they say like ten years. Six, six or 60 million jobs would be yeah, you know, up for grabs? I mean, he told it to, I don't remember exactly what he did, but it was a very complicated thesis. He prompted it to write in a particular style and he says it spit it out. And he goes, and I don't think I could have done it any better. Yeah. That was his exact words. Yeah, which I heard. Is, yeah, I heard him talk about which that. Which is, uh, you know, that's really that's really crazy. All right, I'm going to change gears. There was a great article that Jackie sent us about the rarest type of employees, and I thought it was interesting. Especially, I think uh, I think you're going to like this, Adam, hmm. because oh, good, because I didn't get to read it. So as I'm reading it, as I'm reading it, I'm like, huh, something's occurring to me. So I want to see if this happens to you as well. So the title of this article is "The Eight Rarest Types of Employees," and they simply outperform. Uh, everyone else. And this is it from a career expert. So the first one is the innovator. So this is someone who sees unique opportunities for innovation. The more complicated a problem is, the more excited they get. They're the first one to ask, like, what if we tried doing this uh, another way? The next uh, employee that's rare, that's also outperforms other is the leader. So this is a person who has what it takes to motivate and lead people. They tend to solve problems and oversee complex plans. They have a clear mission that unites the team. Then there's the maverick. This is obviously somebody that goes off the path is an outsider with a different perspective. Then you have the engineer, somebody who likes to fiddle with objects, ideas, or processes to see if they can make them better. Um, They criticize things if they're not good enough or efficient enough. Then there's the expert. So this is the person who's like the special topic is their passion. uh, They like to make an important contribution to their field as an expert. Then there's a target marketer. They understand their target audience, always come up with new ideas. The elite, this is someone who's just among the top tier in their line of work and they're sought after because of their connections. And the last one is the cause. This is a person that feels confident and hopeful that they can change the world. They're empathetic. They react emotionally when they see unfairness and suffering. They feel uh, they, they, they're they trustworthy, reliable, and always willing to help out. You know what you just described? Oh, uh, you get entrepreneur. You just, you just, well, you just described the four of all of our, all of our traits yeah. combined. Characteristics, if you, were, yeah. if you were to go back through that list, then you could, you could attach one of those traits to each each one of us for yeah. sure. Well, as I was reading it, I was thinking to myself yeah. like this just explain this just ex- kind of explain what a excellent entrepreneur would have to possess or have to hire and work, work with. For, yeah. You know? Yeah, I think an, I, so I think it's a good point. A, an excellent entrepreneur has bits of all that. I think to. a very successful company has individuals that are specialized in each of those, yeah, which is what they I excel in one of those. That, like yeah, out. what I what I heard when you were going through that is like, you know, sure all of us have bits of all of yeah, that. Yeah, but some this person's better at that. Yeah, than there's that. like, you know, one of us it's like, oh, that's definitely Doug or oh, that's definitely Justin or oh, that's definitely Sal. Like I see that when I when I hear a list like that, which I I think when you talk about scaling something that's important. Like if you just want to be a good, successful entrepreneur, having a bit of all that stuff, I yeah. think is, is a, obviously a key. Yeah, that's to why success. I said, I think you, you'd want to hire yeah. some of that because you're going to need some Especially of that. Especially where you're deficient a bit. If you go and cross reference that, you know, like somebody that might, you know, possess that, it'd be like great to have that, bring them into totally. You know why that's a neat conversation is because it's not human nature for us to do that. It's actually more, more, common for us to go look for ourself yeah. yes you know so like this, this it took me so true it took me years to kind of piece that together because like, you can see value in your good traits well and and yeah. you yeah. were probably successful that's why you're in a leadership role or you're hiring or you're bringing people on right if you're hiring and bring people on like you've you're already at a a role right that you're you're mm-hmm. leading now whether it's one people one person or multiple and so then you think oh I, i'm successful at this i did well so let me look for the attributes that uh, that I find in myself and these people, and it's actually not a good strategy. 
And so, and it, it kind of works, which I think that's why I did it for so many years because I would find one or two, uh, you know, trainers that were like me and I was like, oh, together we're, we're really good. But then I was, I was always struggling and I was always feeling like I was filling holes and gaps. And I, I felt like I had to carry so much of the load. It wasn't until many years later that I start to look at it more like a, like a football team where I'm like looking for specific attributes in people and I would and accepting like that my wide receiver, it would be a terrible running back. And that's hard when you're like, imagine hiring a trainer and going like, I'm just going to accept this trainer sucks at this, even though that's an important attribute to being a great trainer. That's okay. I'm building a team. Yep. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't need, they, they just need to be good for these things. Cause I need that type of trainer for these types of these it, types 100%. Of clients. Right. I, I didn't figure that out till I was, I think, uh, 23, 24 when I first, I'm trying to think when I first opened, like, like full on open my first business. And I, I looked for a business partner that was organized and an integrator because those are two massive weaknesses of mine. Mm -hmm. so, and that, it took me that long to figure it out. Now consider I had been managing gyms since the, you know, since 19. So it was like four or five years of doing exactly what you said, Adam, like hiring people just like me and then burning everybody out yeah. uh, to where I was like, I need somebody who can do these things that I suck. You know, I suck really bad at. You know, go ahead. I know you, I, I was just thinking about something uh, I, I shared with you and you said you'd seen already. I don't think Justin had saw it, but did you see the, um, I forget what it's called. It's, it's, it's called a paradox, a certain type. Oh, of, Pareto principle. What is it called? Is it the Pareto principle? Is that what it's called? I don't yeah, remember. 80, 20. What, no, 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 not the 80, 20. Oh, okay. This was what uh, Chris Williamson said. I think on Joe Rogan's show, when he was on there, he talked about where, uh, if like, so he gave an example of if something is, uh, less than a mile away, oh, we, I'm we, sorry. we yes, lean towards is, walking. That's right. If something is two miles or further away, we make the decision to, to, to drive in the car. And he was explaining that yeah, on, on how we really numb kind of uh, yes, situation. Yeah. Yes. And how, 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 how often we get stuck in that place as humans. And it's that, called the beta paradox. And that we would actually be beta paradox, beta paradox, that we'd actually be better off in a worse circumstance because the yeah. worst circumstance would more likely Motivate force you us. to get out of it. I mean, I can totally relate to this. I, and I say this when I talk back, when I, when I get questions on interviews of like my, my career path and stuff, uh, when I talk about, uh, my last four years at 24 hour fitness, I talk about them as almost like four wasted years of like, there was four years there where I, I, I knew I probably should leave, but, but I it didn't suck so bad that you, that's right. You forced it it didn't suck bad enough for me to, to yeah. make the decision. And then of course, making that decision was scary, hard. I was definitely challenged right out of the gates, but then ultimately led to the bet. One of the best decisions I ever yeah. made in my life. And it's like, how many people are stuck in that place, whether it be, because it's not bad enough to force them out. Right. right. Yeah. I, I think of job. I think of health. I think of a lot of relationships. Like just, yeah, the relationships. This applies to a lot of uh, aspects in our life where it's like, you know, it's it could be so much better for you, but you are okay with how comfortable it is, and it and ironically, you would you would it would be, be it would better serve you if it was shittier because you know it they, would make you take action. You know what they call that in uh, in sports? All right, here we go. I'm gonna try this. Uh, <laughs> it's like playing to not lose versus playing to win. Mm, yeah. You're afraid of Prevent losing what defense. you got, right? You're afraid yeah. of losing what you got. So you're in this crappy relationship. You don't like the person. You're unhappy, but it's not so bad, right? Ah, they're all okay. They don't cheat on me. They're consistent or whatever. So whatever, we'll just stick it out versus, and so you're like, do I leave and kind of lose this consistency and, and then take this big risk versus I'm with this totally horrible, shitty person. I got to bounce. What do you think those signs are? So if you're somebody who's trying to like assess, like, am I one of these people or am I in this situation currently in my job or my relationship or my relationship with myself as far as my health? Like, what do you think are the the signs that like you're stuck in that middle paradox? Like you're not where you, we, you need to, you need to push yourself to assume or think it's worse to take action and not stay in that place. Like, what are what are some of those signs you think? I God, that's a lack good. of growth. Maybe yeah. I would say, like, like, like you feel stagnant, lack of progress. Mm -hmm. You know, because I feel like that can apply to both the job. It can apply to your relationship. It can apply to your health. Like, so like a consistent and, lack. And by of the progress. way, taking action doesn't necessarily mean that you divorce or, or leave. Yeah, the yeah, situation. No, it could mean that you improve the situation. Yeah, you right. at least you know you know you know what I think. So you, okay, to that point, I'll tie it back to my four years where I I, I, should, so I shouldn't say I wasted it. What happened in the beginning of those four years? I started to take action on personal growth. That was when I started reading. So you so, did take action. So, but I didn't take action. Like I should have left, and also took that action. But 
I started to at least take action on personal growth, which I which ended up up leading to me leaving, building the confidence for me to go like, you know what, I need to go. Yeah, so you did take action. Kind of. Yeah, you're being hard on yourself. Yeah, I think that was the, that was the right action. Though. Yeah, I mean, I think that's what it, it, it led to that when you when you look back, but mm -hmm. I don't think I was. You know what? I this reminds me of people who just complain a lot. They complain yeah. mm -hmm. a lot, and they complain about lots sort of, of different negative things. outlook. And, and yeah, you it and it big at a certain point it makes me feel like either do something about it or change your frame of mind so that you stop feeling so like complaining about everything. Cause yeah. you could do both things, right? You could do one of those things. You could be in a situation where you're just complaining and, you, and you're like, and then you lay it all out and you're like, well, I actually don't want to leave this job. Mm -hmm. Actually, you know, I guess this job is good. So let me just change my outlook instead of being so complaining. Let me like learn how to like, like what I do mm -hmm. or, I complain so much I gotta bounce. I gotta leave this. It's job. so it's so funny how we don't look at that as as a choice and that we we look at it as like this this situation that I, I'm in. And it's like you actually choose to to love or not. It's like yeah. I remember when I first figured that out about um relationships and and the word love and thinking that, oh, I'm waiting to fall in love. I feel like you have a lot of young people that are waiting to to find this career they're passionate about and so they go from job to job and there's like oh that one i wasn't passionate about oh that one. Yeah. and they're waiting to fall in love versus choosing to love something and along that process learning about yourself and so i feel like that same thing applies in relationships also applies in work i loved shoveling shit and milking cows making seven dollars an hour now obviously i didn't stay there and I didn't do that for the rest of my life, but I chose to love it. You while chose I was, to not hate it the whole that's time. That's right. I, cho I chose to I miserable. chose to love it while I was doing it, and yeah. and and to to learn to look at all the things that I enjoyed from it, and and along the way that led me to other things. And I think that's so important than to complain about my situation, like oh this sucks, I only make this much. Oh the hours are terrible. Oh my feet hurt. Oh all these. It's like dude, if you focus on that, that's what you'll get from that. Right? Yeah, that makes a huge. It makes yeah. you know when you learn that a lot. At least for me, was with when having having kids because what you did before, which was fun and exciting is going to change radically. For example, this is an easy example. Go on vac vacation with your girlfriend or your wife without your kids. Totally different. Free, you wake up when you want, go here, have a great time. Go with little kids. If you don't choose to love the new what new vacation looks like, you're going to fucking hate <laughs> yeah. it. You're going to hate it because you got oh, little yeah. kids. You got to wake up early that. anyway. You got to get them ready. We can't eat there. You got to have structure and you yeah. got to keep busy. You know, yeah. you got to keep uh, moving out of the house. I think too, like in, in today's day and age, like the biggest challenge is like delayed gratification. Like to be able to sell that concept, uh, especially to kids and like um, people that are just like introducing themselves into the workforce, like it, to be able to go through that, enjoy what you're doing, the hard work and the process of it to, um, you know, inevitably get to uh, a desired outcome. It takes a lot of that. Um, it, it's, it's a lot longer of a period of time than I think people are uh, accustomed to these days with everything being so instant. Yeah. Totally. Totally. All right. We're going to mention Organifi. I am on another journey to lower my caffeine intake again. <laughs> it keeps climbing up just because of lack of sleep with the baby and all uh, that stuff. Understandable. And so I'm bringing it down because uh, I notice it affects my sleep at night, which then I get this negative feedback loop, right? Worse sleep, more caffeine, worse sleep, you know, whatever. So I'm doing the whole trade caffeine for Organifi Red Juice. And I didn't do that the first couple, the first day. And then I did it the second day. And then I didn't do it the third day. Drastic difference. Drastic difference. So I'm cut the caffeine down by 50 milligrams at a time. And I replaced that with a serving of the red juice. Yeah. And it feels, I could tell I'm having less caffeine. But it doesn't feel like it sucks. The drop off. Yeah, it doesn't feel like it sucks. Um, so it's got some good, I guess. I guess you could call them stimulatory effects, but not like caffeine. It's not affecting my sleep negatively. You know, so. since you brought up Organifi, I wanted to ask you a question that I thought about while I was taking. So I'm, I, I've actually been taking the immunity of theirs because I have, I've had this cold that I've been battling for the last week. Um, is what is what does the science say about? Uh, me taking something like, let's say like the, uh, um, zinc and, uh, things like immunity or the airborns or stuff like that. Um, in the timeline of like getting sick, like, is it more important that I was consistently using it before I got sick? And so that my yeah. immune system can handle it better. Is it more important that it, as soon as I think I might be having, it, I start to ramp it up and do it and then be consistent through it. Is it more important that I do it while I'm going? Is there so there's two parts to that. One is if it is a nutrient that you're trying to fill. So the reason why people supplement with things like zinc 
and vitamin D uh, to prevent illness is because a deficiency in those greatly increases your risk of deficiency. So that's more important pre. All the time. Okay. okay. Then there's this other part, which is studies on compounds that, pr that help fight illness, natural especially, almost always show the effect being more pronounced when you are taking it right at the onset of infection before you even feel symptoms. So that's challenging because you typically don't know you're sick until you're sick. So, okay, you uh, you are the one that has got, I, I never was like this. And I and I do feel like even this like cold, like I, didn't, I mean, I moved my house. I've been working every day, so I'm fighting a cold, but I don't feel that bad. I actually feel, mornings and nights are a little rough. Um, but one of the things I've gotten better about because of I've seen you do this is as soon as like somebody else was sick by me, I all of a sudden, yes. even if I'm not feeling any symptoms yet, I'm just like proactively, yes. I'm going to start ramping and, and including all this stuff right now. And then what I've noticed, and again, it's, this is just my own experience. I feel like the, the cold or the sickness that I go through is not as bad. Yes. You know, where yes. normally I'm kind of a baby. I get I get a little sick like this and I'm like, oh, I'm laid up for like three days. Yeah, so uh, studies on, again, natural compounds show, uh, for the most part, reduced severity and time of illness. So if something works, for example, there's something called andrographis, which has been shown to uh, be effective on um, uh, rhinoviruses, coronaviruses, I think are the two main respiratory viruses. And the studies will show that when people take it and then get exposed, that many of them will not get sick or more will not get sick. But the ones that do, they just have, they just, it's not as severe and it doesn't last as long. Same thing with elderberry. Yeah. And then the studies will show that mm -hmm. if you're in the middle of it and you're super sick and then you start taking the stuff, almost doesn't do anything. At that point, it's like permeated your body and now it's just your immune system un unaided, if you will, and trying to fight this thing. So, all right, we're going to do a shout out. Um, we do this at the end of, uh, of each of these introductory um, episodes in our quads. So this is a person, she's got a small page. That's why I like shouting her out. Her name is Robin Gobble. So R-O-B-Y-N dot G-O-B-B-E-L. She's a therapist and a writer. And her posts are really good for like parenting, you know, like how to deal with tantrums, you know, how to deal with your child's central nervous systems reacting. She actually um, uses animals to model what, you know, how some children act and why you should approach them a particular way. So really, really effective communication style on, how to raise your kids and all that stuff. So really good stuff. I found it very interesting. This is my wife has been following her and she's the one that pointed me in this direction. So check her out. Pathwater is the first certified refillable and 100% recyclable bottled water. It's packaged in a sleek and sturdy aluminum container. Uh, they have still water, alkaline water and sparkling water. So if you care about the environment, you like water, you want to reuse the bottle, stop buying plastic water bottles, go aluminum, Go check out Pathwater. Go to drinkpath.com. Use the code MindPump for 10% off your entire purchase. All right, here comes the rest of the show. Our first caller is Nick from Minnesota. Nick, what's happening? How can we help you? Hey, doing well, fellas. Uh, hope you're all doing well. Uh, yeah, got uh, got a couple of questions for you. Uh, but first off, thanks for uh, thanks for all you guys do. Uh, love your show. You know, uh, before finding Mind Pump about a year ago, I had a couple different podcasts I'd listened to, and uh, now you guys are on constant repeat. Um, I mean, every time I get in my vehicle and my phone connects, uh, you guys are just playing automatically. Hell so, yeah. thank you. Um, on, Nick. Yeah, lo love the stuff you put out. So, thank you guys so much for Appreciate what you do. It. Thank um, you. I got uh, I got three questions for you, and they all kind of roll into each other. Um, but uh, I'll start with a little backstory. Um, for the question. So about seven years now, I've been uh, competing in triathlons. And uh, over the last year, actually, I've gotten uh, fairly competitive with it. And uh, I completed my first ultra distance Ironman triathlon in August, which uh, I took first place in my age group and ended up qualifying wow. Wow. to go to Spain uh, to compete for Team USA at the World Triathlon Championships. Wow. So, Killer, man. So I started training for that in October. I hired a coach and uh, that's going great. All my swims, bikes, and runs are being programmed by him. And I'm programming my uh, lifting sessions, which have been on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Um, I started off with strong lifts, kind of did that for a couple weeks. And then I purchased uh, your guys' MAPS 15. And that's kind of what I've been running so far here. But uh, 
leading to these questions, I thought, you know, there's got to be something better for me. I'm about 16 weeks out and I'm really looking for something to help, you know, boost strength, speed, and endurance. Just kind of help me become an overall better athlete leading into this, uh, this event in May. Um, so my first question is, um, out of your programs, what program would you suggest to be the best for speed, endurance, strength for someone like a triathlete? Um, and then two, with that program, how do you approach um, loading those lifts? Um, you know, do you look at a percentage of uh, your one rep max for like, say, back squat? And am I doing that same weight over all sets? Or do you want me to load each set getting heavier? Yeah, good, que great question. So I'm going to ask you a few more questions, Nick, if you don't mind. Sure. Yeah. Just so that the audience kind of understands, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> the level of your training. Yeah. So, so, um, first off, what was, you did an ultra Ironman triathlon. So give us the distances of each. So it's a run, bike and swim, and then give us your time. Just, I want people yes. to get the idea here. <laughs> so, so the swim was a, a 2.4 mile swim, a 112 mile bike, and then run a marathon. And I did it in 12 hours. Um, and the training I did up to that point was essentially I trained to finish. Um, I, I went out and pushed myself, don't get me wrong, but um, the training I'm doing now is a lot more structured and more serious. Um, I just came off a, a 14 hour training week last week with everything with, with my swims, my bikes, my runs and lifting included. So, so this time around the training is, is more intense. Yeah. And, so. and, and quite structured, but you, you yes. did well enough because to compete where you're going to be competing in Spain, you have to qualify, meaning you, you, you have to be better than the vast majority of people that, that can actually finish these events, let alone, you know, compete at any t type of a level. So most people who do triathlons are like, I just want to be able to finish it. People who do Ironman, I just want to be able to finish it. But you actually did well enough to qualify to compete. I, I, in the I world. actually, I actually think that's because he probably hit a very nice sweet spot of training. Well, it could, I think, and I think what you might make a mistake of is trying to do too much mm -hmm. in this one. I mean, yeah, that. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, that's what I'm hearing right now. I, I, your actual, your your idea of going to Maps 15 <clears throat> is probably, and I can't wait to hear what the other guys say. But yeah. I, I would have steered you in this direction. Not only would I have steered you in a Maps 15 direction, but depending on what your your other coach is having you do for that week i would i would uh, dictate the volume like you asked a question about run rep, one rep max and how much should i load the bar that would be completely dictated on how you're feeling and how your training is going with your other coach on your other stuff because mm -hmm. that i would never want to let's say let's say you hired one of you hired me as your lifting coach while you have your coach who's got training you for your ultra I would want to be in communication with him so I know where to push your intensity and know like how hard you're going on that because I don't want to impede on that in pursuit okay. of trying to get you a little bit stronger. Like, oh, if all I was thinking about getting stronger, I might go, oh, okay, we're going to load the bar this and I'm stretching you. But then I find out, oh, you just had this, you know, 10 mile run yesterday or you've got this big run tomorrow. Like, I, I don't want to impede on that. And that, as far as performance on, on your, your race, that that could hurt you if I'm trying to do too much in the weight room. That's my opinion. I'm yeah, gonna... I'm I'm on board with that. In yeah. fact, the, the coach that you're working with are they experienced at training uh, people like yourself? Yes. Yep. Okay. They're going to give you better advice than we're going to be able to give you because they work okay. with you on a regular basis and they work with uh, triathletes. And these days, most triathletes incorporate some form of strength training. Now, if you asked me this question yep. 30 years ago, mm -hmm. then I'd say, okay, they're not. I, I wouldn't take their advice, but. The person you're working with is going to be able to advise you better than we are when it comes to your strength training. Now, you're 16 weeks out, and I know that sounds like a long time. So, oh, that's four months from now, no big deal. But the the level of uh, a volume that you're scaling from is going to get so high that I wouldn't worry about building tons of muscle and strength until you're done with your race, until okay. you're in the off-season. Off season is when you're trying to build muscle. That's right. In season, yeah. you're trying to protect your joints, yeah. protect your mobility, and, and prevent yourself from and getting improve injured. Improve performance. That's it. So, right. and that's what will give you the best uh, performance uh, improvement. So, at your level, just to be clear, at your level, I'm not talking about like someone who's just you know weekend warrior. At your level, the difference between first, second, and third, for example, is whether or not they got injured or overtrained. 
That's the right. difference. It's like, oh, this guy went in. He just healed from an injury. That's why he got second. Mm -hmm. It's usually not because their training was so much, you know, more intense or whatever. Now you look at like the last five places. Well, now you're now you're talking about that. But at your level, uh, it's about maintaining your health and not hurting yourself. So the way you should view your strength training is exactly like that. So MAPS okay. 15 is probably the most appropriate. Yeah. It's like short <clears throat> workouts every day. And the yeah. way you should approach the workouts is I want to feel good in this session. Don't think of them as workouts like you do when you do your runs, swims, and your and your bikes. Think of them as like recuperative strength training. That's the idea you want okay. when you're going into them. And through that process, you may actually find you get stronger. So for, for clarity awesome. for me, like, so have you already sat down and met with your coach and he's laid out, uh, sort of the entire plan of, of the training leading up to it now and like what the differences are between that and what you did previously? Yeah. So I use, uh, we're using the system called training peaks and he's got it in his system on the coaching side of things. I can't see it. Um, but he can, he has it all the way mapped out right up until race day. Mm -hmm. Um, on, on what I'm going to do and how we're going to, where we're going to peak and, right. and, uh, the taper right at the end. So, yeah, I mean, that's one, something I would, um, definitely try and work with him specifically on like, okay. how did I you would, show how him compliment that? Did you show him maps 15 yet? Does he know what? Yeah, that's what I mean. Like bring has, that. Has I, I, I haven't, um, he just kind of asked, you know, when we sat down prior to start training, um, he, he asked, he, he has background with some straight training strength training for other triathletes he had but with with my experience and what i've done with the past he just asked hey do you want to do you want to do you have a program you're doing and i was like well yeah i got i got some programs i've done before um but that's kind of where he we sounds left like it a, at. he and, sounds like and a i good, said i program it myself he so. sounds like a good yeah. coach because yeah, yeah. He sees that you're already performing at a high level. And so what a good coach will do when they step in is they'll typically say, okay, I'll make some changes. Keep doing what you're doing, all the other stuff, because that seemed mm -hmm. to have worked. Right. So he's actually a pretty good coach. So here's yeah. the deal. I wouldn't tell him to program my strength training. I wouldn't have him coach me on strength training technique if he's not a strength training coach. No, just communicate yep. what you're doing. Yes, but he, but he's, he's going to be a really good judge on total volume, total training, and okay. he's, and I'm sure he's monitoring your times. Yeah. Stress your management mind. is really where you guys need to communicate and, and get on that same level just so that way too. I mean, of course you can like listen to your body and you'll know intuitively like yeah. uh, whether or not you're going a little too hard. Um, but to communicate that with your coach, I think we'll just optimize uh, the rest of the, the process. The irony right. of this is I think that, I mean, you said at the beginning that you kind of went into this first one, like just to complete it, but I, you probably actually did a pretty damn good job Right. Of, right. right. It ain't broke. Don't I did fix surprise it, myself. Know? Yeah. I think you, I think you, and, and maybe in your head, because you, you're, you have, you're an athlete, you have that athletic mindset. Like I could do more. If that's how good I did with barely trying, I could do more. This is a mistake that athletes make many times is because they're like, I have another gear. I have another level. And when you're training for something like an ultra marathon, it's like recovery and taking care of yourself is as important as trying to improve your mile time by, you know, a fraction of a, a, a minute or something. Yeah, right? So re recovery management, injury prevention yeah. is at, the, the, at the high levels is what separates the best from everybody else. Okay. That's what separates yeah. everybody besides talent and all that other, you know, uh, those, those immutable characteristics. What was your background before triathlon, before training for triathlon, uh, triathlons? Uh, well, I, I was your high High school athlete, football, basketball, baseball, played a little college baseball, and then uh, got into uh, running. Actually, I started just, I hit running really hard, did a little CrossFit, got off that, and then I found triathlon, and, and that just kind of took off and learned the ins and outs of that. And I, I was ended up being fairly good at it and was like, I, and I love it. So that kind of just took off. What's your, what's your height and body weight? Uh, five, eight, 160 pounds. You're, you're like the perfect size for, for a triathlete. That's <laughs> yeah. what you typically will find. Right. So, um, Matt, of all the programs we have, I would say maps 15 is going to be the best base and structure perfect. for your current training. I would show okay. it to your coach Yep. and I, and your, your goal is to feel good going into this event and your coach will know when to push you, when not to push you. So you want to feel yeah. good going into it. And then if you wanted to do anything else, of, of what we mobility. offer. Yeah, mobility. Yeah. So MAPS Prime Pro, and what I would do is I would pick okay. 
a few mobility movements for areas that you might, oh, okay, sometimes Ankles, I, I notice hips. Yeah, yeah, extra fatigue here or pain there. Yeah. And then those Feet. mobility movements, you can just practice throughout the day. So literally like if okay. you're sitting right there and you got five minutes, you could do like a you know shoulder mobility movement or whatever you tend to pick. And those things you could just do throughout the day. And those uh, would, won't contribute in any significant way to your recovery, you know, to, to taking away from your recovery. If anything, they'll help. Perfect. Yeah, that's exa exactly what I need. So just just to recap, so like this morning, I did a, I did a sixty minute uh, weight room session. So for maps fifteen, you know how would how would you suggest attacking those lifts? Like do instead of two lifts, do four of them. You're doing fifteen minutes every. Follow the program. Yeah, yeah. just follow. Oh. Okay. And, and, the, and the only way, the way I would uh, would gauge, because I know you asked a question and you're probably looking for an answer for this, is like, like how hard do you go after it? How do I how do I measure on the bar? Right. Yeah. That really is dictated for me by what you did yesterday and what you have planned for tomorrow. And just how you mm -hmm. feel. And this okay. is why the kind of communication with your other coach is important because if he's if he has something planned for you, let's say tomorrow, that's going to stretch you a little bit more than what you did the previous week, you probably want to go into MAPS 15 that day a little bit easier, like more recovery right, mode, like yeah. more like, Hey, I know this is weight. I can easily handle on the bar. I'm going to stick to weights yeah. that I can move energy, soreness, achiness, joint yeah. pain, all those things. You got to really pay attention to that and like gauge your workouts accordingly yeah. here. Don't sacrifice your performance in your runs, swims, and bikes for performance yep. in the weight room. Gotcha. That's going to be a big mistake. So sometimes people are like, Oh, I want to you know, I want to go harder in the weight room. And then the next day you do your run and you're like, oh man, I was, you know, that was off from my oh, normal. I've done that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so you did is you sacrificed the more important thing for the less important thing. Now, if you're going to compete in a strength training event, then I would say yeah, the reverse. Different advice. Right. So don't sacrifice one for the other uh, sure. in this case. Awesome. So they sh it should complement at the very least. It should not take away from your performance and what you're currently doing, but at the best, you should notice better performance. So that's what you're aiming for, and that'll help you dictate the intensity. Did you, Nick? Did you listen to the episode that we did with uh, Corey Schlesinger, the the pr performance coach for the Suns? Uh, I don't think I've listened to that one yet. I'll have oh. to go, go back. Oh, and... go listen to that yeah, because yeah, the advice we're one. giving you is okay. So you are like a you know professional athlete, basketball player guy, and he talks about microdosing training in season. Like, so when they're playing, gotcha. when they get into basketball season, so they peak towards the end and it's very similar to our philosophy around maps 15. And so it was really cool to have that conversation with him. We didn't know that he was going to communicate it like that. And that's right in line with kind of our philosophy on how we would train a, a, an athlete like you is like, it would be these real short words. You could even, by the way, break up because you would be running probably the advanced version of, of maps 15, which is more like maps 20. I would say okay, you could, yeah. you could technically break it up in, in multiple micro doses. You could split it in half. You could do like half of it in the morning and half at night, which would allow you yeah. to increase a little bit more intensity on the lift because of the total volume in that workout. And it's what he calls micro dosing training. So listen to that episode. You can hear okay. him kind of talk about how he handles these professional athletes in season with their training. And that, that is kind of the mindset that we want yeah. you to, have when you're training maps 15 with uh with your running now do you have maps 15 i do i do have maps okay. 15 what yep. about prime pro i do not have prime pro all right i'm gonna send that over to you and then after your event if, if you have an off season that's when performance maps performance yeah. would be a good program Definitely. performance in the off season off yep. season yep yep, yep. But we'll, awesome. off season we'll send too. prime pro over to you awesome fellas thank you so much for uh taking the time to chat with hey me. you know yep. what let me do this also yeah, are you in our forum I am not. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna put you in our forum if you promise to give us. Uh, I want some updates. Yeah. I want to see how well you do. That's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, very Absolutely. cool. Absolutely, we'll do, fellas. And you it's got it. episode 1927. So episode yeah, 1927, they, Corey Schlesinger. Uh, it's the year that uh, Doug graduated high school. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> it was a good year. All right, I'll give it a listen to. Thank you, fellas, so much. You All guys right, take Nick. care. Thanks, All brother. Right, man. Appreciate it. Uh, oh, I love questions like that. That's that's when it gets real fun. Well, those are fun. You know, uh, you know, so funny was hearing him uh, like, oh, yeah, I just kind of trained just to not, just to finish, but he probably- Qualified for the world. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just, I qualified. It's, yeah. It's good... Well, what you got yeah. there is- I'm on Team USA now, it's weird. Yeah, yeah. what you got there is some obvious genetic talent, and what? then he probably did a damn good job working yes, out. Yes, I, I think he actually probably, you know, he probably <laughs> was on the side of like, I'm not going to crazy push myself, yeah. let's just finish, and was probably a nice sweet spot of where he should have been. Yeah. Right. How like, many times have you worked with someone, or maybe you've done this with yourself? He hasn't even peaked yet. Yeah. Have yeah. you guys ever done this where- 
you do well, and then you, oh, I'm going to do that again. Then you overthink it and mess it totally. all up. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's so typical with athletes. Yeah, so I, totally. like, The advice is perfect. I mean, just like get out of your own way yeah. and just like apply that kind of similar yeah. process. To but, it. you know, even if you look, and this is just for the audience to kind of understand, if you take the, let's say you take the 20-minute workouts every single day, what does that average out for the week? 140 minutes. So that's like two, that's almost, that's a little more than two one-hour workouts a week. So someone may say, well, why not just go to the gym? for two hours, which is fine in, under normal circumstances. But in this case here where he's so much working out is going on, so much training is going on that 15, 20 minutes a day has less of a systemic effect right. on recovery than two, you know, 70 minute workouts a week. So even though it's cumulatively the same, the small doses actually are better when it comes to recovery, thus making them better for adaptation in a circumstance like this. Our next caller is Benny from New York. Benny, what's happening? How can we help you? Hey guys, how are you doing today? Good. Good. So uh, I've been listening for about a year and a half now. Uh, I had a job where I was doing a half hour commute. I now commute over an hour to work. Friends told me you should get into podcasts. Uh, so I found you guys and never looked back. Oh, good deal. <laughs> yeah. Good deal. All right. So I guess I'll get uh, right into my question. Oh, also, everyone, thanks you for putting out your amazing content. I wanted to do that as well. Um, and also wanted to give you guys credit because I feel like you really do a good job catering towards new and old listeners. I know when I started, you guys were in like episode 1800 uh, plus or so. I feel like by now I haven't missed a beat. Uh, I've listened to all the things that you guys have to say. But uh, for old listeners, I know you guys are always repeating um, a lot of different ideas and content as well, but you always find a fresh new take on how to present it so that we don't get bored of hearing the same things. In fact, it's reinforcement of all the, uh, of all the great content that, uh, we need to be. We're going to, we're going to edit that for a commercial. Lives. Yeah. Thank yeah you. That's a great yeah. commercial. Yeah. Thank you, Benny. It's a nice compliment. That. You got it. I know you guys put in the effort there, so you, you deserve the credit. Thank all you. Right. Sweet. All right. So I'll get right into my question. Um, it's a little bit hindsight because, um, I was going into the last week. Uh, or I was in the last week of MAPS Powerlift, the peak week, and by now I uh, actually finished up doing my maxes last night. So I guess I'll kind of read my question as is, and then um, you can go through like how you would recommend I go through the max week, and I can tell you what I kind of what I did, um, and we can kind of see what, uh, how that goes. Okay. So, all right. So I have a week left to MAPS Powerlift, the last peak week. However, I'm not preparing for a meet, so I wanted to know when and how I should structure my PR days when I finish. How many days should I wait after the program before I start the maxes? Do I schedule each of the big four lifts on different days? And how many sets and reps should I be warming up with as I approach the PR weight? So that was kind of the first piece. Uh, and then the second piece was that I ran the program using the one rep max calculator uh, that you provided based off the eight rep max as designed in the program. The prescribed percentages felt like the appropriate weight for me yet I happen to know that I've hit PRs higher than what the calculator predicted. How much over the one rep max calculated at the beginning of the program can I expect to hit? Yeah, great great questions. I want to I want to ask some questions though before we answer because if I was coaching you, this is what I bef I would actually ask you more things than I would actually tell you. Meaning what what are some of the things you learned about yourself during the program, Benny? As far as like warm up sets and how strong you felt. Like I've had clients before. What I'm what I'm leaning towards is I've had clients before that they do one warm up set and then they feel their strongest on their second set. Then I've had other guys that they need four or five yeah. warm up sets before they feel like they're at their peak, their strength. And so when I'm training somebody that's like this. I want to find out like who they are. Like, are they are they ready to go on set number set number two, or are they are they kind of like slow to kind of get in the groove? And they want they'd rather have three, four, five warm up sets uh, before they get after it. And your feedback would dictate probably what I answer to you right here. Yeah, so I'm more of a of a slow get into it uh, kind of a person. I think uh, I think Sal's the same way. When he kind of uh, answered a question a couple weeks ago, it takes a lot of warm up sets. So for me, it's about trying to find the balance between doing too many warm ups, um, where I've exhausted myself, quote unquote, uh, versus making jumps that are too big um, and then not being able to hit just because I haven't warmed up my CNS enough. Yeah, mm. Be Benny, a warm up should never feel like a workout. Yeah, that's that's basically it. So you should never feel like, oh my god, I'm getting a pump. Oh my God, I'm whatever. What you should feel like is uh, you're in the groove of the lift. That's how it should feel. So like 
the squat. You know, I warm up to the point where I feel like I'm in the perfect groove of my squat, and then I can jump with weight. And this takes some experience uh, in getting used to. Your first question was how you structure your PR days. Is this, what do you mean by that? You mean in order to hit a higher PR, like what you should do to maximize the PR that you're going to hit? Yeah. So it was like, it was like day of. So I know you guys Got did it. an episode on, on how to, ha- how to hit a deadlift PR where it was more about the programming and leading up to uh, getting good sleep, having enough, you know, uh, food and carbs and things like that. Um, it was more about the workout itself. Um, bec- you know, the, how many sets you should do, how many reps you should do. Um, what I ended up doing was I kind of did my own little, uh, research to see what some other people have put out there as far as recommendations. Um, and what I ended up doing was like, a like percentages, like a 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, hundred percent with a rep scheme of like eight, five, three, one, 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 et cetera. Yeah. Until, um, mm-hmm. and yeah, just keep going. Yeah. You're, well, you're kind of overthinking a little bit. Okay. So yeah. PR days are also not workouts. So you should not feel like you're doing a workout on a PR day. The PR day is just testing yourself. So you do enough warm up sets to where you feel loose and you feel tight and you feel in in the the groove. groove. By the way, a warm up lasts for hours, meaning if you're done with your warm up, you could sit and hang out for 15 minutes before you, uh, you go for your PR. You don't have to like wait. Oh, it's two minutes later. I got to go hit my PR. I usually will warm up. And then right before my PR, it's like 10 minutes. Yeah. I'll just be chilling and maybe doing some stretching, maybe moving around a little bit. And then 10 minutes in, then I go and hit my PR. So, and the reason why I'm saying you're overthinking it is because you got some numbers that you got off uh, some information. And that, by the way, that sounds good. But what I don't want you to do is get so stuck on those numbers yeah. that you end up as a general parameters yes. more than anything. And I think to each one of our advices, like it's going to vary even between us. Uh, so there's a lot of individual variance to it. Like for me, I, I, I'll warm up. Much to like what Sal is saying, I don't treat it as a workout. Uh, I'm actually doing lighter than I would normally go. But what I'm doing is spending extra time, you know, reinforcing my grip, like all the technique and, and the yes. nuances of it and like squeezing intrinsically and getting intensity that way in terms of, uh, you know, leading up to like firing my CNS. Uh, so that's that's sort of the technique I apply. Uh, and then that way my, my body feels like it responds once I get, you know, higher amounts of load. This is this is also a lot like actually bodybuilding in the sense of le- trying to. So one of the hardest things that I oh, don't yeah. think I ever accomplished was peaking on stage. Yeah, that's good. I, I I did six shows. I prepared for years. I also did preps that were not even for a show. So I prepped myself mm-hmm. many many times to try and peak. And I never brought what I thought was the best version of myself on stage. Why is that? Not because I lacked any information because I did a lot of research trying to figure out what does everyone say about how much carbs, how much water, with the timing, what kind of pump should I do? But there's such an individual variance that you have to kind of just tweet. You have to keep trying it, trying it out and see what works yeah. best for your body because peaking is very individualized and peaking for a way you want to look it's super psychological and, and peaking your, your max you could get out that day. Like you, you may find out like we could sit here and give you like all these, like, Oh, do this, do that. And you find out like, man, all I, all I was missing was I needed to the day before yeah. the, where I needed to be mentally and the way I needed to sleep, boy, that made the biggest impact. Or I, I don't care. Maybe it was a fucking pair of shoes you wore. Like, man, I just felt so grounded and connected when I wear those sneakers versus those other ones. Like, so it's when you get to uh, the, the level that you're asking of like, how do I get the maximum, you know, peak, you know, uh, rep out for myself, boy, is that going to be very unique to, to you. And a lot of the, 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 the truth behind it is here's some parameters. And I think we provide some of them. I think the internet will have some good tips for you, but to Sal's point, don't get so married to other people's, uh, you know, philosophies around how to peak, use those as like kind of baselines, but kind of try them out and see if it works, but tweak it a little bit to what you like and what you feel and test it like that. And it's going to take a few times probably for you to really master what that looks like. And like I said, I still don't think I, I figured that out for myself for bodybuilding, it's like it's it's such a, an, an art to figure. I, I bet you even training at what time of the day will make a difference on your PR. Like yeah. you, you may be, you may you said last night you did your PR, but you might be better yeah. at noon or better at eight. Well, you know, and, and in terms of like you know the the rep 
kind of projection calculator. Like we actually like use the eight rep because of the risk to reward kind of factor with that. Like, so because this was more of a, a beginner coming in to learn powerlifting, like we, we use that uh, formula uh, instead the, the the higher you go with that in terms of like the less amount of reps, the more accurate prediction it'll probably yeah, provide. My, those are almost always off for me. But yeah, they're, yeah. I, they're, they're general and I have, uh, I'm a lot stronger than I should be at the low rep ranges and a lot weaker than it should be at the high rep ranges. So those those calculators, if I go above six reps, they start to really get thrown off. So use it as a, as a baseline. But okay, think of it this way. Benny, if I was going to have you throw darts on a board and you were trying to hit the center, by the time you got to the fifth or sixth attempt, you'd probably start to get a little more accurate, right? Okay. So what, what you're warming up isn't... it's Because people have a misconception about warming up. They think that the muscle itself has to somehow become warm and pliable as if it was in the refrigerator and it's like a piece of steak and you got to take it out and whatever. Now that may be true if you're sitting in the snow and then you go inside to work out. But if you're just in your house or in the gym and you're going to work out, the warm up isn't doing that as much as it's getting your CNS ready, meaning you are, you're, you're priming and getting your body ready to exert maximal safe force and also organizing your muscles and technique to maximize your leverage. So think of it that way. Think of the warm up sets as practicing to get to the perfect technique and form to maximize your leverage. Not, I got to get my muscles warm because they're cold. That's so warm up, I think, tends to throw people off. It's like, oh, I got to get my muscles warm. That's what's doing it. No, it's not. It's getting your CNS in the, in the right groove, getting the technique perfect. Just like a a baseball yeah, the player of firing all has to line up. You, you, yeah, the, the skill practice. Yeah, Correct. Yeah. That's one hundred percent what a warm up is. It is not get the muscles warm and pliable or whatever. That's like a secondary effect that happens from it. It's really about the the, the skill and technique and, and perfecting. And that. so to that point, when you're choosing the weights that are preparing you for the the PR. I would always lean on the light. Just, I want just enough weight on the bar that I can I can accomplish yes. that. I can so, accomplish. I can get my technique down. And it's like okay, I want to conserve all that extra energy for that attempt at that PR. I don't want to at all waste any of it. And that could happen if you're like trying to do percentages. Like oh, I'm gonna go fifty. Yes. I'm gonna go 60. sixty. Like to Sal's point, sixty at five reps might gas him a little bit. And now he takes away from his one rep max. One rep max. So he's better off. Not worrying about the percentage going like, you know what? When I warm up with 225, that is enough weight for me to feel that, feel that, get my CNS fire and get it in the groove. And then I'm going to go from 225 all the way up to maybe freaking 500 and something. Like yeah. it, it, That's where the individual variance is going to be I'll, here. I'll, look, give you an example, Benny. Um, do you, are there exercise of the four main lifts? Are some of them easier for you to do technique and form wise than others? Uh, yeah. Okay. So I'll, I'll give you a personal example. Okay. So for me, the deadlift, I can get into the groove very quickly. So let's say I go and attempt a PR. Uh, recently, I hit a 605-pound deadlift. Here's what my warm-up looked like. It went 135, 315, 405, 605. What were the reps, though? What were the oh, reps? it was it, 135 was eight. Then I went up to 315. I did three. Then I did 405 for one. Then I went 605. Now, that's because the deadlift for me, I am I get into the groove and the technique very quickly. Now, if I go attempt a PR in a squat, I'm doing a lot, a lot of you know lead-up sets because it takes me a long time to get in the groove and the technique of a squat, right? A bench press for me is somewhere in the middle. So that's why I'm telling you these, these, these estimates. You might be overthinking it because if you looked at my warm-up, if you took somebody who had trouble with the technique – of a deadlift and you had them do what I did, they might hurt themselves. But for me, a deadlift is a very natural feeling exercise. Squat, on the other hand, very unnatural feeling. And I got to work my way up step by step by step, 15 pounds at a time before I attempt a PR. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, that, that totally makes sense. And, and as far as how long after finishing the program, how long you wait before you start doing your maxes, obviously, I, so I took a couple of days off um, after I finished the program. I know that last peak week is only two days workout. So I did it on a Thursday and a, and a Sunday is how is where I finished it. And I know the Thursday is a heavy deadlift day on the last week of peak week. And the, and then the very last workout is a heavy squat day and heavy bench day. So I essentially took Monday and Tuesday off, took two days off. And then I started my maxes on Wednesday. I did deadlift on Wednesday just because I had almost a full week rest from the last time I deadlifted. Then I did strict press on Thursday, 
took Friday, Saturday, Sunday off. This way the upper and lower body both get rest. And then Monday, um, I did squat. And then yesterday I did bench. And, and, that, and now you want to do that again, but you want to know how long to wait? No, it's just when I asked the question, it was before I did all that, uh, but I guess it doesn't hurt to, I guess it doesn't hurt to ask, um, could you do another round of maxes or, or to see if you do any better a second time around? How did you feel with those PRs? Did, did you feel like- So I actually felt pretty good. Okay. So by the way, everyone out there, the program works. The <laughs> uh, program totally works. Um, another so I weigh in the low 160s, uh, low to mid 160s. Um, I PR'd my strict press. Uh, 20 pound PR hit 175. Uh, my squat, um, I hit 325, which is the most I've done in like three, four years. Um, it's not my max, but it's almost at three, four years. Last night, I hit a bench of uh, 260, which is five pounds off my PR, most I've done since 2012. Um, and then um, my max deadlift, I hit 475, which is a 15 pound PR at a 160 body weight. Wow. Um, so the program works, which kind of leads me into a follow-up question of obviously it takes between um, how much between programming where your body just adapts to that style of lifting, heavier weight, lower reps um, compared to my actual body weight um, and surplus and, you know, just being and having more muscle. Um, where to focus as far as I kind of have this goal of since I'm in the 160s, um, I want to hit like three times body weight as a goal and hit the 500 club um, with my deadlift. So oh, you'll in those do that. areas, where, where, where should I focus most to try to, to, try to get there? You'll do that. Uh, how do your joints feel? Joints, joints feel pretty good. Okay. You can, I would take a week off and run then I'd equal. restart mass power lift. Yeah, run it again. And you, you'll, hit a, you'll hit 500 pound deadlift likely. Or get really damn close. Yeah, because what I kind of had in mind um, is that I would maybe run map symmetry, uh, try to correct some you know imbalances that I might have, and then if I come back to map powerlift after that, any maybe energy leakages or any technique breakdowns because I might be pushing one side or another. I definitely know that affects my squat. Maybe not so much my deadlift uh, or some other areas. That's great. Um, that would work. That's not a bad idea. But also, if you gave me the feedback that you're feeling really good, I'd probably right. want to run it back again. Yeah. I mean, because that's not like you're you're overdoing it. Many most of your power lifters stay in like that's a how power, they train always. They train like that all the time for a long mm -hmm. time. And we normally have to give people the advice of symmetry or performance or prime pro because there's, there's obvious dysfunction. Yeah, there's yeah. obviously breakdown. They obviously have been training that way for too long. You sounds like you've really just got back into training this way and. And you've only done it through powerlift. I would probably get you back at it just so I could see because we might see a night. You might see a pretty big leap in everything. I I would venture actually to see all time PRs in the second time around. That's right, what I think. Write it back. I, I think would take a week off and then start it again. Yes. Week week and a half off and then start it back up again. Yeah. Okay. So because I thought maybe I just needed to be heavier, so I have a little more leverage, a little more of a surplus, so I have a little more muscle mass to work with. Because one sixty, I feel like is kind of light run it in a bulk put your pound lift yeah. run, run power lift in a bulk yeah bump your calories bump the cal i mean i love really love to see that thing. now and i'll consider this like as the heavier you get the heavier your deadlift's gonna have to be for your triple body weight so keep, right. keep that yeah. in mind but i mean I, if you want to build muscle just just bump your calories 500 yeah. calories go up yeah. 500 you look pretty lean so I, I would be no problem all right yeah sounds ben, sounds good benny do you have map symmetry yeah, so I already have map symmetry, which I was going to run next. And then I kind of also have maps uh, performance just for the long haul when, uh, yeah, when I start wanted just focusing on, on the longevity of my body. So I kind of already have that in the, in, in the future for when I'm ready for it. Great. Uh, but I'd love to uh, check in with you guys. Uh, I know people don't ask for programs, but I'd love to get, get in the forum with you guys. Yeah, and, uh, oh, done. Done. Done deal. Yep. Uh, Let's get you All the right. Thanks for everything. And uh, before I head out, just uh, two things. Um, when I finish, um, so whenever I'm caught up on on your episodes, I go back and I listen to the old stuff. I'm in like oh, episode man. 120 or something <laughs> oh, like that. Yeah. The jazzled. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good you, one. you guys are funny now, but you guys were hilarious then. Oh, you got to bring back those I wild shows. <laughs> Justin, that voice of an angel has got to come back. Uh, Q&A, Q&A. Nobody's uh, been asking you for it. Uh, since, uh, <laughs> you just bring it, bring you. it back one time. Uh, and, uh, and second thing also, um, so I feel like everyone's got a nickname except for Adam. I mean, you got 
You got Tiny Beard. You got the Journeyman. You yeah. got Doug the Spinner. Why yeah. doesn't Adam have a nickname? Uh, well, he did have a nickname. Well, yeah. I mean, you, we, you did have a nickname. What'd you, you give me? You don't remember what your nickname was? No. What'd you give me? I don't remember. I don't. Oh remember. yeah, he he was the uh, Doug, Doug Poon Shaking whisperer. His, the Poon whisperer. Poon whisperer. Oh, that's right. <laughs> oh, he didn't like that one, that's, and obviously his wife doesn't right. like that that's one. Right. To, to, Doug's, <laughs> yeah, to right. Doug's dismay, I just yeah, we stopped calling him that because of that. So yeah, he caused a little trouble at home, so we had to bring it down. We just call Moody now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mr. Toenails. Yeah, you got yeah. it. Thanks, Good Benny. Up, Thank you, bro. All right. All right. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. I feel like I feel like if you listen to our show now consistently for like six months, then you can go back to the originals and you'll like them. Because <laughs> you have to like move. us first. No, yeah, you have that's to. That's true. I don't even know if I'd say that. You have to. You can't just listen to it. You have to really like us. I feel like you have yeah. to. You have to watch. You have to watch the show today and you go like, I, I love those guys. I love these guys. Yeah. And then you go back and then, it, then it's like, en- whoa. Then, it, then it's endearing. Are these it's the same it's guys? It's endearing. But if yeah. you're like, oh, I kind of like the show. Let me see the old ones. I hear yeah. people say, it, then you're like, oh my god, it was terrible. those guys are terrible. What's yeah. wrong with those guys? Super rough and raw. Yeah, 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 yeah. You have Good to have. A, you have to have a special place in your heart yeah. for us. You know, I I really do feel for his question, the, the overthinking PR <clears> thing. It totally. You know, it totally. And I don't know if you guys can understand or relate to what i was saying but it is very much so it like is. like peaking on stage in bodybuilding you have to peak your strength you have to peak the way you look i mean they're just both and by yeah. the way i guarantee there is like power lifter guys that were listening to us give the answer like oh the, you should do this i'll or, use the 825 yeah, right? yeah right and they're because yeah, you're a power lifter yeah. probably because very competitive just you like know. just like yeah. bodybuilders there was somebody had an opinion on how to peak and everybody criticized each other. And what I learned was, dude, there's such an individual variance that if I get so hung up on this coach's way of peaking and maybe it worked better than this coach. And so then I think he's brilliant and he's an idiot. The truth is this, my body is more like what this guy. And so you, I think you have to learn that when you're trying to PR strength and when you're trying to present the best physique ever is there's going to be a, a massive individual variance. Yes, there's some great information out there for like a, a guide to kind of start, but you should definitely play with that a little totally. bit. Totally. Our next caller is Katie from Colorado. Hey, Katie, how can we help you? Hey, guys. Um, like everyone, I just want to thank you for all the content you put out. I look forward to it every day. Um, I'm a 30 year old female in Colorado, um, walk a couple miles a day with my dog and lift two to three times per week. Um, but I also like doing a lot of, um, outdoor activities, like either after work or on the weekends, um, backcountry hunting, backcountry skiing, mountain biking, um, all kinds of stuff. And, um, my question is how to train to get the best, um, bang for my buck for both endurance and strength. I know I'll never be, um, as good as I could be at either one of those while trying to do both. But, um, you know, I need a lot of endurance for a lot of these things I do. Um, but once I get there, you know, if if we're hunting and we're, you know, five miles back, it's going to take me a lot of time to get there and I want to be able to keep up with everybody. But once I'm there, I also want to be functional and have, have the strength to actually participate in what I'm doing once I get there. So, um, I guess my question is just how to train to, um, maximize both while keeping them in balance, um, while understanding that I'll never be the best at either one, um, because I do want some of each. Well, you're good. I'm glad you positioned it that way, but mm. really what you're looking for, Katie, is to be the best at the things you enjoy doing the most, right? Which you can do. Yes. So it's not what you, what you do requires a combination of things, strength, mobility, and endurance. So we can train you or you can train yourself to be your best version for that. I have a question. Uh, when it, when you are doing like the backpacking or these, these days that we're referring to that, like you want to have that endurance, what, it, give me kind of a look, like how long are you hiking for? Is it like a, are you, is it a long old hike where it takes, you know, days or is it like hours? Like how long, like how many miles, like, give me an idea of like, because how I would program your endurance training within like a program, like mass performance would be dictated by how long of a gas tank I need, need you to have like you training someone who wants to be an ultra marathon runner versus someone who just needs to do like a strong five, 10 mile hike is, is different, right? Sure. Uh, it ranged from, um, you know, an hour or two out on, on backcountry skis to maybe a week long trip for like hunting. But, um, I definitely wouldn't say it's on the order of like ultra marathoning. I don't need to be going constantly for, mm. um, you know, days at a time. It would be probably up to about, um, five to eight hours of hiking at any given time before I'm stopping and, and resting for a bit. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, let me get, okay. So I'm going to give you a general answer and then I'll get a little bit more specific. So generally speaking to get the, the, the core of your training should be those things that you enjoy doing. So in other words, <coughs> the majority of the time that you spend exercising should be spent 
backpacking, hiking, uh, cross-country skiing, all the things that you enjoy doing. And then you want to use strength training as a way to supplement. And generally speaking, if you want good functionality, quote unquote, and I, I, I do that in quotes because that that's such a big umbrella term. But if you want good functionality, then you need to be good at overhead pressing, rowing, pressing horizontally, squatting, lunging, and rotating. So think of those as your core kind of movements. And then within those, if you if you look at those movements that I just listed, right? So overhead pressing, horizontal pressing, rowing, um, squatting, lunging, and rotating. So six, six, six movement patterns. If you look at all of those, there's a lot of exercises that kind of follow or fit underneath each of those categories. So that's going to be general. Because let me get a little bit more specific. Map performance would be great for you. Map symmetry, symmetry would probably be great for you. Especially Ma because in, in phase four too, it yeah. has like deliberately those like movements that would probably pair best to you. Uh, and it's in a very simplistic uh, uh, layout. Totally. And then maps cardio. Those would be the three programs that I would pull from. Now, the only one that allows for in its programming, it allows for you to do these long hikes and runs and all that stuff because the others you'd have to kind of modify Cardio is MAPS Cardio. MAPS Cardio we actually designed for people who like to go out twice a week and do- Someone like her. Right. But so you can take MAPS Cardio and just plug in what you normally do and the programming's already okay. set up. If you did MAPS Performance, I would take out workouts. I would do like one foundational workout or two foundational workouts and same thing with MAPS Symmetry. So, okay. but those would be the three programs to pull from. Uh, for Do you have any of those, Katie? Uh, no, I have anabolic. I just started anabolic and that's the only one I have so far. Okay. So oh, I yeah. say we give her cardio because that one is the most practical for what she's trying to do. Yes. And then my recommendation would be to put, later on, maybe get symmetry. Yeah, I'd look at symmetry later. Yeah. yeah. And then right now with okay. MAPS anabolic, Katie, what you can do is I would do, uh, I'm assuming twice, at least two, two days a week, you're doing some of this other stuff, right? Uh, yeah, usually um, probably two to three times a week on average, I'll do something that's a little bit more cardio related. Okay. One to two foundational workouts a week. That's what you're going to do with MAPS Anabolic, not three. Okay. I know there's an advanced version for three, but I would do the one or two and keep it there. And you're still going to get some great benefits, especially if you're relatively new to that kind of strength training. And, and then after that, do cardio. And the way you decide that is based off of the activities you're going to do that week. So if you, because yes. like, you said a range of like, oh, two to three times a week, I do some of these more cardio or endurance based things outdoors. Uh, that would be how I dictate whether I did one day that week of strength training or two days that week. So you might have a week where you're like, you know what, I'm only going to go on one or two hikes this week. It's raining outside or whatever, and I'm going to stay in. So th that that week, go ahead and train two times foundational days. Other times you might be, oh my God, it's a beautiful week. I want to get out as much as I can this week. And you're going to go out and do more outdoor and door stuff, scale back to one foundational day. So right. you can actually play with that week to week based off of the other things that you're doing. Right. Okay. And if I, if I am only doing, um, like one day that week, because I'm doing some other activities, uh, would you just fill in like another trigger session on that day or just do mobility or, you know, just something that feels good. You can um, actually do, like what would you do on that day? You can do trigger or mobility yeah. sessions whenever you want. Pretty much whenever. If they feel good. Yeah. yeah. Regardless of how much you're working out. Um, but if you only do one, Keep like the activity, intensity lows. All yeah, there you go. Keep the intensity low. But if you're doing like one, if you only did one hike the whole week or whatever, then you could do the two strength training workouts that week. That's when I would do two. Got it. All right. Great. Well, um, thank you. I, I look forward to trying this out and see see what the results are. You yep. got it. Sweet. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye bye. You know what's interesting? I'm going to give Katie a compliment. You, you, I'm sure you guys can see this too. There, this isn't always true, but because we've been doing this so long, I can look at someone and look at their face, and I can almost <laughs> always tell. Not always. I can often tell what kind of sport or athletic or type of training they do. And she has that healthy, uh, I do outdoor activity look. You, I could, I could have called, I could tell. Very outdoorsy. Yeah, but she has that healthy, like, you know, yeah. I like to do that kind of stuff. No, it's, it's a good question. Good son. It's a really good question because balancing the two is so important. But I think that the, the gist of it is the thing that you want to get better at or be good at is what you need to do the most. That's right. the bottom line. Right. Not, not the other stuff. The other stuff is just to supplement it. Well, I think the, you, it's easy to confuse strength training as like, oh, I, I need to always be trying to get stronger in the gym yeah. in order for it. But really when your pa your passion is around these things, strength training is there to complement totally. those things. It's not, and, and it, it complements it 
by you scaling it back on the intensity and adjusting it around the things you love to do, not by pushing harder in there. Think, but the, the thought, and I know what people think, it's like, oh man, if I get stronger in the gym, that yeah. means I'm going to be more muscular and I'll be better at these things. And so they end up pushing too much in the gym, trying to increase strength in there. And then it ends up hindering the thing that they love so much. And it's like, no, your focus is around the stuff you love. Let the training, and you're always better off leaning on the side of probably less is better with totally. the, the strength training and then inching your way up with maybe a little bit more, or maybe I'll try to be a, a little more intense this week versus like, I'm going to follow this intense strength training program. And then I'm also going to try and do all my hikes and the things that I love to do. It's like, it's the kind of a reverse thought. Our next caller is Rob from Ohio. Rob, how's it happening, man? How can we help you? Hey, so, um, <clears throat> I'll, I'll kind of give a real quick background and ask my question. Um, I was uh, military Air Force 1989 through 2013. Um, most of my focus back in the day was strength and endurance. Uh, I would do um, endurance activities, uh, marathons, triathlons. I did a couple other uh, Tough Mudder Spartan. Did my last competition in 2010. Uh, life kind of happened and I stopped doing anything after that. I retired in 2013. Uh, made a conversion uh because endurance wasn't in my wheelhouse anymore uh so i started doing power lifting uh making pretty good uh gains in the gym and uh, it, it was always a means of justifying bad healthy eating habits i've never had good healthy eating habits i was burning so many calories doing the endurance stuff uh, when i stopped doing it and i retired uh my diet never changed and, uh, and i started to see the fluffier I got, the the more weight I would move. And uh, it, it kind of hit, it came to a head last year. Uh, October 1st, I decided to make a change. I was um, 51 years old, five foot 11, uh, 240 pounds. And uh, I was about 27% body fat. And I refused to buy a pair of size 42 waist jeans. So <clears throat> I, uh, Went to my coach, said, hey, I, I want to lose, I want to lose weight and I want to enter a competition. I need a I need a goal to hold me to. So we signed up for a for a powerlifting meet. Uh, he put me on the vertical diet, uh, stand efforting. That's how I found you guys. And then um I seen the weight come off pretty good. I started tracking my macros. Um, and when we were about uh, 12 weeks out from the meet, and I'm about five weeks now. He really changed uh, what we were doing in the gym. And we started doing a lot of um, uh, Louis Simmons, West Side Barbell, uh, the conjugate method, uh, doing things I've never done before. Uh, banded, uh, chains, a lot of speed work, everything dynamic effort, max effort. And uh, man, it's been, uh, I feel so young again. But uh, I, I, that's, that's where my question comes in. I've already got plans for next year um i want to compete in the same weight class but instead of being uh my current 22 percent body fat i want to go in at um 16 to 18. so i want to take this year drop about uh 12 pounds of body fat i re-add it with muscle um hit my next competition again same weight class uh move bigger weights be leaner and uh and my question is can the max effort dynamic effort this conjugate method of training be sustainable long term for a natural raw lifter, I'm not equipped. Um, I'm clean, and, and so that's that's where it comes down to. It's, uh, is it healthy? Is it safe? Maintain that um, max effort, dynamic effort, long term. What a great. Okay, so um, a couple of things here. First off, you said natural, meaning obviously no anabolics. Raw means you use a weight belt and uh, what knee knee wraps, and that's it. Or in, I don't. Yeah, I don't do wraps. I do I do compression sleeves, and that's okay, it. Sleeves. Okay. okay. All right, so that's just for for listeners who don't know. Okay, so Louis Simmons is a god with powerlifting programming. Some of the best exercise programming, strength training program, I, I should say, that you'll find anywhere in the world yep. is in powerlifting and Olympic lifting because you either lift the weight or you don't. It's very objective. It's very scientific. So when it comes to powerlifting um, programming, I mean, you can't go wrong by trying, uh, you know, something like a Louis, like Louis Simmons style programming. Now, here's where the, the challenges come in. Here's where I'd say I want you to keep your eyes open. And this is just because of the sport of powerlifting itself, really not because of uh, his style of training. 
is you want to pay attention and make sure that you don't start to develop aches and pains in your joints as your strength starts to go up because you will get strong, but you may notice hip pain or knee pain or shoulder pain. And what you don't want to do is mask those things um, and continue to try and improve your strength because then you'll hurt yourself. So mobility and working in different planes of movement, you, you yeah. might want to inject you know, two or three weeks at a time of that kind of training in between training cycles where, okay, for three weeks, I'm going to do mobility, maybe map symmetry, something where I'm doing unilateral work and then go back to your powerlifting training. That's the only mm -hmm. thing. And that's really just, the, that's really just, just to interrupt itself. it really yeah. is to interrupt the cycle of you staying in that same sagittal plane too often. I'm not as familiar in terms of like rotational movements in, in the conjugate method. Um, but I know like it's super solid programming uh, geared towards uh, powerlifting, but that would be something to consider is just like making sure that you're taking your limbs and everything through its full range of motion capacity. Uh, so that way, you know, you don't, um, uh, you know, get that repetitive stress that is inevitable uh, when you stay in something like that too long. I, I don't think we're going to be much help yet. I think where we could help you is when you start to run potentially into a problem, we could have some answers for you. I think you've got some of the best on your side right now. If you're following a West Side Barbell program, you got Stan Efferding's diet that you're running, which we, we I would stand behind yeah, that also. Solid. I, I like everything you're doing and and what you're saying. You I, you you you. By the way, you dropped the body fat percentage too when you said that like, you've got you've got incredible results so far. You're feeling great. You're feeling younger th than you have in a long time. I actually probably wouldn't want to fuck with too much right now. I but I would to Sal's point, pay close attention to you and be asking you as you're going along like how you feeling. And I'd want to hear that. And as long as you're telling me, Adam, I'm feeling good, man. I feel good. I feel strong. We're getting leaner. I, w I would keep that going until you start giving me feedback. Ah, I'm starting to feel a little bit of this. And then I might, okay, let's scale back a little bit of intensity. Let's talk about more, more mobility into your routine. Let's talk about rotational stuff like Justin's alluding to right now. But I, I mean, I kind of like where your mindset is right now and what, you, what you're, what you're doing. I, I kind of want to see what you do. In fact, if you're not in our forum, I'd love to put you in there and, and uh, talk to you as you go through the process. Yeah. Here, here's going to be your challenge uh, because you know, I'm reading your question and, and I, you know, I, you told us your, your uh, background a little bit. You did, you were special operations in the military. So you were up there. Yeah. And so that, you know, when you bring up the joint pain, um, the, the, the aches and pains, that's daily. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's hard to, to differentiate sometimes. Do I hurt because I went to the gym or do I hurt less because I went to the gym. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Probably both. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, so, okay. So, yeah, so. but if you're, okay, if you're, if you're improving, we're moving the right direction. So like if you, if you have less pain, that's right. If you're, if you're not, if you're, if you're not getting more pain than what you're used to dealing with, that's a huge plus. If you're getting stronger in the gym, that's a huge plus. I'm looking for, Adam, I'm not moving, getting stronger and I'm not feeling any better. If anything, I might even be feeling worse like that. That's the, that's the kind of the red flag I'm looking for. If you've been dealing with joint pain most of your yeah. life and kind of ache and stuff like that. Yeah. You, you're probably right. The, the gym might actually be helping. It really that. depends on your, your goal. Like, what do you want? Like, do you want to alleviate pain? Cause then that's a different protocol completely. I would, yeah. I would I, I, look, here's the Achilles. The Achilles for power lifters is that as long as weight is being added to the bar, everything else is okay. And what they tend to do is they tend to address nagging uh, pain with more warm up and wraps and, you know, that kind of, just so they could do the lift and they can lift more. So, so here's what I'm going to say to you. And I, I mentioned your background because you, because of your background, I'm going to guess that it's really hard for you. You probably have two speeds, like nothing or full speed, right? So, <laughs> so your challenge is gonna your challenge is gonna be how to go in the in between sometimes. How I can cruise a little bit, allow my body to catch up while staying motivated. You probably only feel motivated when you feel like you're balls to the wall. Otherwise, it feels boring. So that's gonna be that's gonna be the the challenge. So I'll say this: after this meet that you do. I think you should run map symmetry and focus entirely on feeling better and then go back to your powerlifting training. I think that'll work wonders on your mobility and some of your joint pain. And I want and I want to put you in the forum. So if you don't have symmetry, mm -hmm. we're going to give you symmetry for free, free. Plus, I'd love to have you in the forum just so we could check up on you and hear how you're doing. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Yeah. Um, I've, I've changed a lot just from, and I've only started listening to you guys since November, but um, the foam rolling, oh my God, I never knew anything about that. And it's made such a huge difference in my my pre-workout prep. Um, 
so yeah, that's that's absolutely. You guys are such a benefit um, to what what information you put out. Yeah. Well, you, the, what you just said is get, get, tells me very clearly that you'll benefit tremendously yes. from mobility. Symmetry, work. I think, is is yeah. money for you. Foam rolling is a is a great band aid by itself. If used in conjunction with mobility, it could be really good. What I mean by that is you, you you foam roll, you'll feel better right away, but you're not solving the root issue. So eventually foam rolling starts to work less and less, and then you start to develop more and more problems. So what that tells me is that you would benefit greatly from mobility. Yeah. Greatly. So I think symmetry would be, would be great after this meet for sure. Okay. Awesome. All right, man. Thanks for calling in. I appreciate it, guys. All right. Got it. As soon as he came on, I didn't even see his thing. Uh, same until, thing, right? Hey, I, 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 like, <laughs> that's like one of those bad motherfuckers you can just see. You just see like you just don't want to. Oh, Sergeant Matt, I, didn't, yeah. I didn't even know that until Sal said that. I didn't read that far down into his question. Obviously, we saw he was military, but he just had that. He had that. Yeah, look yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so when he says like, oh, you know, I have some aches and pains coming yeah, from a guy a, like him. <laughs> yeah, his tolerance is probably super high. Yeah, yeah. But I'm glad he said the foam rolling thing. If if you get that much benefit from foam rolling, you need mobility. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah, mobility would be life changing. You know, to, yeah. to address that pain. Totally. Yeah, yeah. Look, if you like the show, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out our guides. We have guides that can help you with almost any health or fitness goal. You can also find all of us on social media. So Justin is on Instagram at MindPumpJustin. Adam is on Instagram at MindPumpAdam. And you can find me on Twitter at MindPumpSal. Today, we're going to teach you everything you need to know to build a strong, well-developed chest. When I think of you know, weak points and, and areas that I struggled with developing for a, a really long time, chest was up there with the- Yeah, it was for me. It was for me for sure. I got more caught up in the weight I could lift versus how I was developing my body. I think it's one of the most challenging muscles to develop for most people because the form and technique. 